now reconvenes this work session, meeting of the Plano ISD Board of Trustees in open session at 6.20 p.m. on September 19, 2017 at the Plano ISD Administration Center. My name is Missy Bender, President of the Plano ISD Board of Trustees, and tonight we conduct our meeting focusing on the district's two major goals. Number one, ensuring the continued improvement in student learning, and two, ensuring the efficient use of resources. You're going to hear a lot about that tonight <laughs> and how we're going to do that in the upcoming discussions. At this time, the board will address agenda items for discussion and action. We have one item for action tonight, and it is concerning a strategic planning consultant. Um, the Plano Independent School District is launching a strategic planning process that will define the district's direction for the next five years. And Carla Oliver, the Assistant Superintendent for Government and Planning Initiatives, and CFO Steve Fortenberry will begin the discussion. Carla. Thank you, President Bender. At each of your spots, you have a report written out that just gives some high points about the consideration of the vendor. And then also, if you'll notice, there is a timeline going over that. It's really, it's really just in visual format of what we have discussed in the past. So this evening, we are recommending that um, Here we go, I was looking for my recommendation. I knew, I just didn't want to wing it. Um, based on the recommendation from our staff, uh, which is listed on your report of who considered the, the proposals, Cambridge Strategic Services are recommended for our vendor and facilitators. Okay, Steve, any, any comments from you? No, ma'am. I, I think my name was basically on there because this was processed through the purchasing department. Okay. Thank you. So we did an RFP, went through a neutral process. We did. We have the scoring mechanisms that were included in our packet, and this, this firm uh, was scored at, as the top firm. So do I have a motion to approve the recommendation? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? I actually have a question. Um, we'll Cambridge use any people who may have been former employees of our district as part of the strategic planning team or will be a completely independent team? Um, the folks that we have interfaced with have all been independent and have not been a part of any of our previous teams, but we can certainly make that request. It was a completely different uh, leadership and contacts for us. Okay. So they've also not participated in any of our academy discussion teams or any of those others? In the not past. to my knowledge, no. Okay. I mean, that question has been asked, but I will verify again. Mm -hmm. I actually um, heard from a colleague in Arlington about this firm, mm -hmm. and it was good things. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So is this firm associated with any other company, or are they just standalone? Standalone, from what I can tell. And, and of course, they all receive the same packet, as, mm -hmm. you know, which is standard for all of us. Their responses can all be a little bit different, and, you know, pending this, pending that. But with our team that went through and used a, a rubric to really kind of go through and rank, it was clearly the choice. It was within the price range uh, discussed, and, and that's why we were going forward. And they had good references. I'm trying to recall if I know who this firm is. Is it the Bill Cook firm? Bill Cook is not who I spoke with. Okay, so it's different. Okay, got it. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All right, all in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so that's the only item we have for uh, action this evening. And uh, I'll, I'll just mention, by the way, we're now filming our work sessions. So, uh, smile. <laughs> and uh, we're, if the law says that when you have action at a work session, you now have to film it, we're just going to film it. So. so I guess my request to evaluate the cost of that is withdrawn. <laughs> we're filming. Okay, so our next item is for information only, and it has to do with the accountability system update. And Dr. Dash Wersinga will provide an overview of changes in the STAR testing system and the accountability system. I was about to say good morning, good afternoon, evening. So, that as you said, uh, 
uh, President Mehta, this is just an update on the, the star changes and the, and the prior accountability system. We're going to do, uh, we're going to kind of get into the new accountability system, which is kind of in development a little bit later on, maybe in, in a future board session. So uh, the, this is, this particular slide going back to the very first year of STAR kind of gives an outlook of how kind of the testing program has changed. Uh, in, when, when STAR, ta st really STAR, ta STAR started <laughs> in, in, uh, in 2012, but that, that year we did not have accountability. And the second year of STAR in 2013 is the very first year that the accountability system started. And as you can see, the, there was no, the L here in this uh, report is for a STAR version that is linguistically modified. And that is mostly for English language learners. And that very year, in 2012 and 2013, STAR also had a modified version. And that was a, almost like a below grade level, like a one year below grade level version of STAR for some severe uh, uh, student, special ed students with, cert with certain levels of disabilities. You had to qualify for that particular assessment. Uh, you could just not, it was not open for every special ed student. So the big change happened in 2015 when that modified version of STAR went away and all students, there were two versions of modified. One STAR assessment for special ed, one was a modified assessment and there was a little bit more rigorous test called accommodated, which is uh, almost the exact same test, but with some uh, accommodations to like, make descriptions and meanings of uh, question stems easier. So in 2015, modified was replaced by star A, and that was a very big challenge for, our, for mo a lot of special ed students. And accountability, though there was a test that year, it was not used in accountability. So all students that took star A was excluded from the accountability system. In 2016 was the very first year that every test that was taken by the students were included. And in 2017, there was a uh, change in the sense that the star A for special ed students with accommodations, and star L, that is linguistically modified, was folded in to the regular star test. And it was only given online. And in that version, almost, they broadened the, uh, the, the students that can receive accommodations. And it was the same platform. And you could have given a regular ed kid the star test online, and the next computer a special ed students or an English language learner could take the star test and they will be they will have all these accommodations available for them uh, the linguistically modified test for example has text to speech so they can click on a word or a click on a phrase and it will read the question and the answers for the students so the only thing that wasn't uh, read to the students was the reading passage everything else was could be read for English language learners and special ed students. So, and some of these were, were challenging for students. For example, you know, these, some of these accommodations on the assessment were not regularly used in the classroom because there are no platforms to kind of replicate these things in, in curriculum. So, so, you know, so there were some students kind of used it, some didn't, and we were not exactly sure whether they really extensively use the ones that they really needed. Oops. Then there was uh, uh, one additional change uh, in the STAR system was this is to comply with, with state law. Uh, and I will talk about the very first one. So on the STAR system, I don't know whether you, you saw it, there was in the newspaper and so on about the short answer in English 1 and English 2. It was, there was a lot of questions on the scoring of it. Uh, it was delaying the release of the results because there was a lot of work behind the scene, uh, <coughs> scene to get these scored. So as a blueprint change on the test itself on English 1 and English 2, 
they, they took out the short answer. Short answer is 10 line maximum responses for three questions. And that, that was almost about a third, almost a third of the weight of the test. And that was taken out and replaced by, by some items to kind of cover the same material. So that was a big change in English 1 and English 2. In, st in grades 3 through 8, there was a state law that was passed that said 85% uh, of the students must complete the assessment in two hours in 3-5 and in, in three hours in 6-8. In and this was really the big impact uh, for the change. And uh, in order to comply with that, uh, in writing test, they took all the field test items out, which in some cases could have been four, five, six, seven items. And they took the field test uh, composition out from the writing test also. This is in fourth and seventh grade. Can I ask a question about sure. that on the field test? Is that for their information on creating future tests? Yes. Exactly. And so they're kind of, I'm glad they were able to get rid of that. Well, uh, there are pluses and minuses. They have to field test items for the future. Okay. They, had, they had enough in the bank that they could do this. But, the, but most likely, we can, we can go back to what happened like five, six years ago, where in the fall, they had to give an additional star test where they tested some of the, especially the field test prompts. Mm -hmm. They had to be tested before they could be given, and that's almost a technical requirement. So the, it's taken out from the main test, but they will have to test these prompts in the future at some other time. And they sampled? districts and tested some um, classes, I guess? Well, it, it, they will, we are told that they have enough prompts in their bank for about a couple more years. Okay. So maybe in about two years' time, they will say we run out of our prompts for compositions and we may have to come back and test. So they will, normally when they do that, a whole campus is selected to test. So. Uh, we, we might get about three campuses that we need to test in fourth grade and seventh grade. So, so this is this table kind of describes the reduction in the items, and the first the top table is reading. So other than third grade where it lost six items, all the other grades lost eight, and in math every test lost fourteen items. So which is I know it was in, in third grade, it is a 46-item test. So it was considerably shorter. And you know, psychometrically, you, know, you can give a 20-item test. You just had to question what's the validity of the assessment is. So only thing is, most probably, individual students <coughs> may have impacted. Because when they took out items, you know, they didn't take all the easy items or the medium items or the hard items out. They, had, they took items out from all ranges to make the test equivalent from year to year. So uh, individual, for passing rate averages for a school or for a district, most probably it did make an impact. But for individual student, it would have made most probably a small impact. In writing, for example, uh, so it, uh, in 15, 16, there were 18 multiple choice and one composition. I, uh, I did include the field test there. And then the, it, was, it went to 24 multiple choice and one composition. That's the only one that kind of increased. And this was almost, this is a blueprint change that is technically not associated with the law. This was just made to increase the accuracy of the assessment. In grade seven, the writing remains the same. The only thing that went away is the field test on the prompt. Uh, science uh, in fifth grade, eight items less and 12 items less in eighth grade. Social studies, which has become the most challenging test for our students. Uh, you know, in the older days, you know, tax days, you know, we used to get 99% of the kids passing this assessment in, in eighth grade. This kind of proved to be one of the most challenging tests in, in the system. So, other than some minor changes in the accountability system, kind of the concept is, uh, has remained, this, this is like the only year the accountability system has remained the same from 16 to 17. 
So still we had the index system, and this was the last year of it. Uh, again, you meet one out, first out, second index, and you had to meet the third and the fourth. The, what we call passing changed. In, in prior years, you know, there was these technical terms here, level two satisfactory, it was considered passing. Uh, there was final level two satisfactory. Uh, in some places you may have seen it final, some places you have, may have seen it as college and career ready standard, and there was the level three advanced. And one of the requirements was, uh, this was, uh, that commissioner kind of put in place was to define what it means. And uh, in the old system, this, the passing standard was gonna change every year. That is the level two satisfactory standard was supposed to change every year until the year 2018, and then later it became year 2022, it will equal the final level two standard. So, so that system was very confusing to everybody. So they came and renamed this as approaches grade level, meets grade level, and master's grade level. And these are set in place. They are approaches grade level will be there forever, at least until 2022 in, in okay. terms of starters, because <laughs> most probably by then, by that time, starters most probably will be redone. Uh, but it's not changing year to year. Because in, 20, in 2015, the standard changed. The, the, what we call passing increased by a few items. So there was a, that was shown in our index once and index three scores. I'm gonna go through some of these. If you all have any questions, you can kind of ask. Uh, if there's a sign that says, uh, a note there, no change, that means this remains the same as from the year before. Uh, index one, uh, it's overall passing rate. It's all students, and the standard was 60 for all campuses. Index two was student growth. Uh, now it has different standards for elementary, middle, and high. And what does 32, 30, and 17 mean? Well, it is somewhere around the fifth percentile. And, and the goal was that if, you, if the campus is below the fifth percentile in the distribution of all elementary schools, for example, it will be flagged as not meeting the standard on that index. It's a little bit complicated uh, as you, you get one point for meeting growth and you get a bonus point on top of it if you exceed growth. So campuses that have large proportion of high performing kids uh, because of the ceiling effect, you know, you know, they got very high scores in it and then campuses with, with a lot of economically disadvantaged students that didn't have that high performing band, you know, they kind of went up. They don't go, kind of go and get the opportunity to get that bonus point. Uh, index three is closing performance gaps. Uh, again, there's a different standard for elementary, middle, and high, set close to the fifth percentile. Uh, this, uh, I was explaining to Dr. Bingley, this most probably has nothing to do with closing performance gaps, but uh, idea here is it's a subgroup of the school. Uh, this is economically disadvantaged, and the prior year, so 2016, the two lowest performing race and ethnicity groups. So for most of our campuses, it was African American and Hispanic, and so was for the district. Uh, there were some exceptions, a uh, lot of homogeneous campuses. Uh, they only, they didn't get a subgroup because they only had one subgroup that is large enough. Uh, so in that case, they were only evaluated on, on a 25 economically disadvantaged students uh, across the board. So there are two standards here. Uh, you can see the index one was 60, right? It's a, you can say that kind of makes sense. Passing rate is 60. Here the standard is 28. Why is it that low? Well, that's because students are evaluated at two different standards. Every student has the opportunity to get two points. Uh, one point they earn by passing, and the second point they earn by meeting the advanced standard on the test. So technically, if 100% pass 
and 100% meet the advanced standard, you can get 200 out of 200. So uh, if a school, for example, is you get uh, index score is here is 40, so it will may most probably happen this way. 70% of the kids passed, 10% of the kids reached the advanced standard, so the average of the two is 40. So uh, 28 is the, somewhere around the fifth percentile. Index four, uh, again, the cut score was set for meeting somewhere around the fifth percentile. For elementary and middle school and, uh, and high schools, this is only a star-based assessment. And for senior high schools that have, or schools that have a graduating class, so senior high schools uh, and the academy, it is based on the graduating class. Now, this is an year behind. For the graduating class, indicators are all a year behind. So academy, te though technically they had a graduating class, they didn't have one the previous year, so they, they are not included in that part of it. Here, they are measuring in grades three through eight and nine, 10 campuses. They are measuring the college ready standard, which is the level two final or the new name, meets grade level standard. Uh, and for the schools with graduating classes, it includes graduation rate, uh, graduation plan rate, and, and post-secondary indicators. And that can happen in multiple ways, SAT, the, the TSI test, and ACT, and so on. Dash, this is the one that ELL gets pulled out of? This Yeah, in this component, all ELL students are pulled out because uh, the expected, in order to exit the ELL program, you had to pass the STAR test. So it doesn't make sense to evaluate a student at a higher standard than passing and include ELL students in the denominator because had they passed, first you had to pass the test before you reach the higher standard. So ELL students are not included. So high ELL- Well, it doesn't make sense isn't always the metric, but nonetheless, <laughs> I understand. Well, some things that don't make sense are in the system, so. So, so again, there's no change in, there were some minor changes. Uh, they counted, there were some kids, for example, who were in elementary and middle school who jumped a grade, who didn't get to benefit from the growth measure. So they put things in place to, to give the students the opportunity to like for, I mean, in, in elementary, we get about, we have about 20 kids that, that, that advance, that's a grade. So they, they, they didn't get to benefit from the growth measure before. That was almost an oversight. So things like that were fixed, that, that didn't really impact. In middle school, you know, we have math kids who accelerate out and, and skip from sixth grade to eighth grade or seventh grade to algebra one. And those, those some minor tweaks were made to fix some of those things. The one change that did take place that, that impacted uh, to some degree is the comparison school methodology that is used for distinctions. The, they added two new variables, percentage special ed. Well, let me first. So the old system had campus size, the enrollment for the whole campus percentage economically disadvantaged, percentage ELL, and the mobility rate. So using those four, they found the 40 closest schools using uh, a f formula. Well, for 2017, they added special ed, and this didn't impact any of our, our schools, percentage enrolled in early college high schools. We didn't have early college high schools in 2016 against our senior highs and high schools, and by inclusion of this, it, it didn't make any difference in, in the way it was done for Plano. Uh, now, the hope was really, including special ed, for like campuses like Davis, uh, or Haggard, and Vines, and, and to some extent Plano Senior, that have a large like centers like the DFED program, uh, they will get kind of a fighting chance of competing for distinctions. Uh, that, that's kind of the idea, and now, Plano, you know, that maybe that's 
the campus that is most affected by this number uh, percentage special ed, but you know, every district, every large district has one or two schools like this. Josh, how, how do they just uh, define that early college high school program? Is that a specific program, or is, are districts who give opportunities for, like we do a few courses at Collin College, does that count towards that? Uh, no, uh, this is a very particular distinction. There's, a, uh, there's an application process. Okay. They had to apply to T. First, you had to partner with a two or four year college. This is basically high schools where you, after four or five years, you, you, when you graduate, you earn an associate degree. So you first had to partner with like Collin College to have that program in place. Then you had to apply to TEA and get this designation uh, of an early college. Uh, and the TEA has a list of these schools because they have gone through an application process. Uh, accountability distinctions remain the same. Uh, you can earn uh, one for progress, one for closing the performance gaps. The methodology is the same. You have 40 schools and you have to be in the top 10. Then you can get a distinction for English language arts, math, science, social studies. And the district is eligible to earn a distinction for post-secondary readiness. Uh, if anybody wants to know how you earn one of these, there are like somewhere between eight to 15 indicators behind each one of them. And a certain proportion of these have to be in the top 10 of the 40 schools. So for an elementary school, half the indicators for English language arts needs to be in the top uh, quartile. Uh, for high schools, uh, uh, for middle schools and high schools, it's 33%. It's, it's, uh, uh, post-secondary readiness <coughs> is an accumulation of all the post-secondary <coughs> indicators from all the high schools. In our case, it's, it's only senior high schools. And you had to get 55% of these had to be in the top quartile in each school. Uh, it used to be 70 uh, and uh, statewide. And they, I think when for, for it started in 2014, so 2014, 15, 16, it was uh, 70, and the schools that earned it, other than maybe Carroll ISD, uh, uh, and I think Highland Park earned it for like a couple of years, they were pretty all small districts, pretty homogeneous schools. They, they lowered it to 55, uh, hoping that they will capture, give like urban, large suburban district a chance to earn this distinction. And it didn't turn out that way. The, uh, there aren't any uh, large urban districts here. Yeah, so that, doesn't that have to do with the fact that in those smaller districts, the kids almost by design are put into the CTE, many oftentimes CTE, which make them program completers, which make them then eligible for this. Yeah, so, yeah. so if you have a CTE, or they, have, or they have a dual credit program right. where almost every kid takes like a dual credit with their local community college. So they have kind of a, uh, they have some pathways program that, that they could leverage. Wanted to make sure we understood why yeah. small districts seem to have an, an advantage. Uh, this is where a robust curriculum kind of works against you. Yeah. So this is a little bit of a teaser for the future. The, uh, the new accountability system is based out of uh, House Bill 22, which replaced the old 2804 uh, that the A through F started uh, two years ago. And there are gonna be three domains. The first domain is student achievement, and that will have kind of two parts. Uh, there will be a student achievement part, very similar to index one, and there will be for high school campuses, so for us, senior high campuses, or a school that has a graduating class, they will have what is called college and career and military ready. It's CCMR now. Uh, the, and there are about 13 indicators in that system that a graduating class, uh, campuses with a graduating class. So there are like a two parts. Uh, they don't know exactly how to combine the two parts yet, but it will, it will be a lot of numbers in there. 
in, in domain two, that is school progress, will also have two parts. Uh, it will have the growth part, very similar, somewhat similar to what we have in our current system in index two, but they will also have uh, a relative performance path uh, that, that the commissioner thinks is very important to the system. It simply is a, it's kind of a, it's a regression line. The expectation is, if a, let's say if your campus is 65% economically disadvantaged, they compute the overall passing rate. And if you are above that score, then you kind of beat the average, and if you are below that score, you will be a C, D, or F, depending on how far you are from other schools that are 65% economically disadvantaged. So they have a big regression line system with bands going, and if you are far above the norm, you will get an A on one side or an F on the other side. So it's relative performance across the board. Uh, it's gonna be broken down into bands of uh, 20, like 5%, 5% bands, and there'll be a kind of lookup table, and you pick your ED rate, and it'll tell you, with looking up your passing rate, whether it's a, you are an A, B, C, or a D campus. Uh, that's, that's kind of new uh, for, for the growth mission. Now, in the school progress mission. Now, elementary and middle schools will have growth and relative performance and high schools most probably will not have growth at all because there's a kind of a limited number of this is basically algebra one repeated. Algebra one kids who didn't take algebra one in eighth grade and then English two are the only high school camp tests that have growth. So they're gonna most probably take it out. Dash, this is a Im pretty important piece that you're talking about with that, with that regression line which is the scatter plot that everybody um, you know, the big um, concern on many people's uh, uh, mind was that we didn't want some kind of predetermined, there has to be so many Fs, so many Ds, so many Cs. You know, the idea is there should be a standard and let's hope that we can all get there. Well, by definition, the, the, the regression line is going to make sure that there are half below and half above. And the commissioner says, yeah, but we're just gonna do the regression line this one time. And then after that, everybody can keep accelerating. But if you realize the reality behind that, I mean, that would, the notion that that line being set based on a line of prediction one time, it would take a long stretch to yes. believe that that's going to statistically change an awful yeah, lot. Basically um, saying that the whole regression line, if it didn't change, it, will keep moving up like 5% every year. It is what it will take to go from a C to a B to an A yeah. in the future. And So while it's true, everybody could get an A, that's akin to someone once said, it's, it's open to all, like the Ritz. Um, so. So that regression line, how did you say that's computed? Is that so all the all students in Texas or all the students in Texas? It, it, it'll be based for elementary, middle, and, and high schools separately. Okay. All grades combined, and it is passing rate on all tests statewide for elementary schools uh, uh, regressed on or uh, scatter plotted against uh, economically disadvantaged percent on the campus. Okay. So it's a, it's a downwards slow and uh, I saw some simulations. If you are a 100% ED campus, the requirement is only 33% of the kids to pass to get a C because that's how steep the regression line is. And if it's a 0% ED campus, that number is like 60% pass to get a C. So uh, um, I'm not sure how it is if people figure out that only a third of the kids pass the test, and if you give them a C, you know, if, if you're 100% ED, I mean, we don't, our, our lowest passing rate in, in Plano is, is somewhere around close to 60. So 30, 30% is, is a, it's less than a third of the kids needs to pass the test. So I have a question, Dash. So when, um, when they were simulating 
the values, you know, when they were first rolling this out, um, at the time there was criticism that you're not making it possible, like Brian was saying, to, for everybody to be successful. You're you're designing by by design. You're making sure that only certain campuses can obtain this you know, rating. And the commissioner said, oh yeah, just for, just for now, but later, when it's the real thing, that's not gonna be the case at all. So what I'm hearing is, however it is it's been designed is, is different than before, but what's similar is that, once again, the outcome sounds like only certain campuses will be able to, only X percent will be able to get an A, and only Y percent will get a B. Is, is that that, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's right. So but that question was asked this morning by the commissioner uh, uh, in Austin, and this is what he said. Well, we are basing the regression line on 2017 data for 2018 school year, and we are fixing it for five years. But, but you know, but still, you, you can't race that line across the board by that many percentages in one year. If you looked at the last five years of regression lines, Dash, they <laughs> yeah. would look virtually it, identical. It's, it's identical. I, I mean. It, the line hasn't changed by other than like about 2%. Maybe at some years it even stayed the same or went down. Uh, so it has, line hasn't gone up uh, across the state uh, in the last three years. So it's not, uh, theoretically, yes. Because in, by 2022, maybe the line has gone so far up, everybody can get an A, but and I don't think it, that's how it will work. I guess I would say, hey, we're Plano. It's B's are better, A's are even better. And so I think what we're gonna be talking about the next two, three hours will help us get to that path. And I think that's what we owe our kids and that's what we owe this district. So as much as this may be kind of a funky way to do it, I have confidence if we put our mind and our resources to it that we can have kids in any economic circumstance that are excelling. So the districts will get A through F's this school year. We don't know what the cut scores are, but we will get them. The system this year and next year will be pretty much identical. What I mean by this year is this school year. Uh, only difference is there won't, cut scores for A, B, C, D for campuses will not be determined, but only there will be only one cut score determined, that's to differentiate between D and F. So everybody who is D and above for a campus will be met accountability standard, and everybody below that D cut score will be improvement required. So, but for all other purposes, the accountability system is pretty much, will be brand new for campuses and districts next year. And it will be very close to that the year after. But okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, we'll now turn our attention to the enrollment report. A brief report will be given on enrollment data as of September 5 of this year by Mr. Fortenberry. Thank you, President Bender. Uh, this is the time of year we uh, always present this report. Most of the state data when you, uh, when you draw comparisons is based on the end of October. That's the state snapshot day. But we like to get an early look uh, at it to kind of see how we are compared to the previous year and then also to the projections that our demographer provides. Uh, this slide takes the Tuesday after Labor Day from this year and compares it to the Tuesday after Labor Day from last year. Before I get much further into this, uh, I want you to concentrate on the, the September of 2016 uh, data, and you'll I'll, I'll come back to this over and over again. So if you weren't even looking at the 17 and you were looking at, at last year's data, and just in a completely stable world, there were no move-ins, there were no move-outs, there were simply kids moving from one grade to the next. Uh, the very fact that we had 4,158 seniors and only 3,487 kindergartners, if we simply moved each grade forward one and replaced that 
kindergarten grade with another one of the exact same size, we'd realize a decrease in our enrollment of 671 students just because we're moving out a bigger class than, uh, than we're moving in. And later I'll show you some birth data that kind of shows you how that, that comes about. Uh, there is some bright news in this report or some, some, if you really dig deep into the numbers, there's some things that uh, are positives that I'll get into. So uh, this first chart though does compare enrollment from last year to this year based on the same day after Labor Day. Uh, despite the fact that we would have had a 671 student drop, uh, we've actually only realized a 409 student drop and that's because we have had some in-migration of, of students with uh, the little bit of new housing that, that we have, uh, and then I guess some households having more kids. So uh, that, that does tend to be a positive. Were it not for some growth with housing, we'd, we'd see even lower numbers. Another way that we like to, uh, to look is really our, what we call the cohort progression. That's simply looking uh, last year's kindergarten versus this year's first grade, last year's first grade versus this year's second grade, etc. And you really see positive numbers in each one of those cohort progressions with the exception of uh, three grades, uh, fifth to sixth, and that's usually kind of a small, that's going to be a smaller cohort progression because you may have some fifth graders that uh, a handful that don't move on to middle school. Uh, and then the big one that you see throughout the state, uh, probably pretty much anywhere in the country, the, if you look at your, your freshmen that move to the sophomore grade, there's always going to be a negative there. It's not, uh, to some extent, in, in a lot of districts, that could be an indication of dropouts. Uh, in, in Plano and many other districts like us, it's more of an uh, indication that there are some students who did not have enough credits to in our system progress from uh, from ninth to tenth grade as far as their classification, that number dropped 232 students. I went back and looked at last year; it was a drop of 208, so it's very similar. Uh, but all told, we had a, a positive of 221 students in our our cohort progression from grade to grade. Another positive, if, if we look at the kindergarten enrollment. Uh, by the way, back on the the very first slide, let me back up. A very positive thing for us is that the kindergarten number actually at this point has grown by 37 students. Uh, and as you'll see on this chart, if you look at the kindergarten enrollment column, uh, the last time that we had any growth was actually from the 2011-12 year to 2012-13 in kindergarten. This is a, a, a chart is provided by our demographers, Templeton Demographics. Uh, it shows the birth year and then correspondingly <coughs> five years later, the, the year that those kids that were born in 2006 would have entered kindergarten. So in 2006, there were 3,721 births. Uh, they do that by zip code. It's not pure for PISD. Uh, but the zip code, they take those that predominantly have Plano ISD geography in them, uh, and those are the ones they use. So it's not an absolute match, but it's a pretty good match, and you can see a very uh, stable trend, although it's, it's gone down. It's a very consistent uh, correlation between the, the year of birth and then the five years later what your kindergarten enrollment is. So again, on that first line, 3,721 kids born in 2006, and then five years later our kindergarten enrollment was 3,834. Uh, you can see that those number of births have gone down uh, all the way to 2012. They had dropped about 450 kids from 2006. There was a bit of a rise in 2013, another increase in 2014, so that's a pretty good sign for us in years to come that we bottomed out on the kindergarten decline and those numbers should be starting back up. The last three numbers in the, 
the actual kindergarten enrollment column. And by the way, this kindergarten enrollment uh, is not as of the day after Labor Day, it's as of that end of October snapshot date. So the numbers may not necessarily agree with what you saw in the previous charts. So for 1718, if you look at the kindergarten enrollment, that was actually the projection from the demographer. Uh, since the, the live births in 2012 were less than those in 2011, he had projected yet another decrease. Uh, but we were actually day after Labor Day, instead of 3,435, we were at 3,524. And as of this past Friday, we were at 3,536, which is actually a little bit more than the 2011 number. So that seems to be an indication that that downward uh, slide actually stopped a year ahead of time uh, with his projection. So, uh, the importance of that is that as he projects that grade now moving progressively to first, second, third, et cetera, uh, and the incoming kindergartner class continuing to increase, uh, hopefully that's going to kind of stop the slide that we've had uh, in our total enrollment over the last five years and, uh, and maybe put a, a backstop to that. One thing anecdotally that we discussed in cabinet, uh, I think is very interesting. Uh, and again, it was just kind of a hypothesis that could the fact that that kindergarten enrollment went ahead and jumped a year ahead of time be any indication of the, some sort of impact from the fact that in 2016, 17, we expanded our pre-K program. Uh, It'd be real hard to prove that out. I did mention that concept to the demographer and uh, I told him I didn't want him to do any studying because I don't really know how in the world you would prove that those kids would not have been here anyway. But just immediately he said, well, that's the same impact that Fort Worth had when they expanded their pre-K program. The following year they had a big, a much larger than expected bump in their kindergarten enrollment. So. Uh, not sure if that's a direct correlation, but uh, it was certainly not something that he was unfamiliar with. He had uh, he had seen that in another district, so Steve, there could be something to that. Can I but, ask a question? Yes. Well, I know he goes to 2014 on the birth rates. Is there any way we could see 15, 16? Because I'm seeing a trend. You know, 2008 was the housing crisis, and then I think people may have, as you see, the numbers going down, put off having kiddos maybe for a couple of years. But it seems like the trend is going up every year from 2012 back up. I wonder if there's any way to look at that. I'll check with Rocky and see. Uh, that data is not, there is delay in having it available, okay. but I wouldn't think it's a three year delay. I, I believe, and the other thing that's a little quirky with it, I believe the birth year is a calendar year, and of course our enrollment, or kindergarten cutoff dates August 31st. Okay. Uh, so again, it's not completely pure, but uh, I'll see if he has the 15, I mean, 16. He'll probably it's have a them by. That's all. Well, and he'll probably have them by this fall when he updates uh, our projections going okay. forward. We'll be getting those in November. Okay. This is a comparison to the projected enrollment. Uh, his projections again are based on where he thinks the numbers will be on October 31st. So we still have uh, about seven weeks to get there. Uh, we were, the day after Labor Day, 366 students below the projection. Uh, and that's pretty much across all grades with the exception of kindergarten and, uh, and eighth grade, uh, where we actually were already above his projection. Historically, we grow from the day after Labor Day to that snapshot date in October. Uh, the last two years, we've grown between, well, a little over 200, between 200 and 250. And as of this past Friday, if you compare that to the day after Labor Day, I looked at that and we're already up 135 students uh, since September 5th. So uh, if we're in that 200 to 250 range, uh, we still won't quite meet the projection, but we'll be a lot closer to it than, than 366. We'll probably be somewhere in the vicinity of 100 or 120 kids. 
below the projection. Our pre-K enrollment, uh, as we've expanded the program again, we've had a growth of 225 students in the early childhood programs. Uh, that's both at the three early childhood schools and the uh, traditional elementary schools where we've added that, that strand. Uh, the, uh, the PPCD and the Head Start numbers are basically one off of, and that could just be a one day thing uh, mm -hmm. from where they were last year. Uh, the early childhood school figure last year had expanded by about 70 kids at this point, so uh, we've seen even more growth in it this year than we did last year. This is something that uh, really just a chart that we kind of like to make people aware of each year. Uh, really, I'd like you to focus on the Man, those colors are hard to see. Green and red, I guess. Plano and Frisco. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Frisco has surpassed Plano as the largest district in, in Collin County. When you look at that chart, you can see where the difference is. Uh, basically, we have a lot more students than they do at the high school level. Pretty big gap there. But they've got a much younger student population. Uh, and so they, uh, particularly in elementary and middle school, they, they have a, a lot more students than us. Mm -hmm. The next chart, just so I can make the numbers look like 50-50, I took out the kindergarten numbers. So I used the first six grades compared to the last six grades. Uh, you can see in Plano, as well as Allen, McKinney, and Louisville, uh, districts that aren't certainly not growing anywhere like Frisco is uh, over 50 percent of their kids in those 12 grades are at the high school and middle school level so like us those districts are graduating more kids than they're bringing in in kindergarten Frisco is is just the opposite they're at almost 52 percent early grades and 48 percent the upper grades so uh, just an indication there that even without housing growth, they're probably going to continue to to grow as long as they keep feeding as many kindergarten kids in as they uh, as they have each each year. And that's really not any different than uh, this chart has looked the last two or three years when we've looked at it. So that's it. Uh, enrollment is down slightly. It's not quite where the projections are, but I think there's some, really, if you look at the kindergarten numbers uh, and the in migration, there are some bright points to it that uh, tend to point for a, a, a stopping of the slide that we've had the last few years, hopefully. And uh, Rocky will be updating those numbers, as I said, in November, and as soon as we get them, we'll, we'll get them to you to kind of see what this year's actual numbers do to their projections for future years. Thank you, Steve. Any questions? Okay. Our next report is uh, related to the topic of enrollment, but uh, it has a different slant. In accordance with board operating protocol, two trustees have presented an agenda item request to discuss the possibility of allowing tuition-based enrollment for out-of-district students. The administration has prepared a brief informational overview to also be introduced by Steve Fortberry. Uh, thank you again, President Bender. As you said, this agenda item uh, was requested by two board members, and uh, so we we have not spent a tremendous amount of time compiling a lot of detail or recommendations. But the main purpose is to kind of give you an overview of uh, of what we do know and to gauge further interest from the, the board as a whole before we uh, would delve into a lot more detailed study. Uh, by way of background, the Plano ISD, like most districts, allows out-of-district enrollment for children of our employees, uh, but we really don't go much beyond that. Uh, and when I say much beyond that, some a few exceptions that uh, the district does make. Uh, if we have a student that's begin their senior year and they move out of district, we generally allow them to continue uh, 
to where they can graduate from the district that they've been in. So uh, some minor exceptions with smaller numbers, but our, our biggest exception, and again, it's we're not alone in this, we do allow children of our employees uh, who don't live in the district to, to bring their students here. Wanted to, and there's more than just Coppell and Lovejoy, but I did want to use those two since they're nearby, uh, kind of as an example of some districts that go beyond that, that first bullet. Uh, they allow some out of district students that are not children of employees to enroll. Coppell ends up with about 140 to 150 students uh, most years. Uh, Lovejoy's numbers range from 70 to as high as 100 students. I think this year they're, they're looking at about 100. And the way that they, they handle it's kind of very different. Uh, and so I kind of wanted to point both of those out. And uh, there's some very counterintuitive things that fall out of this from the school finance point of view that uh, when the state Supreme Court said the current system was a Byzantine, whatever they called it, uh, this is probably a pretty good example of that. Awfully lawful. Yeah. It's, uh, it's real bad, but we're not going to fix it. That deal. So let's start with Coppell. Coppell does not charge tuition to out-of-district students. Uh, and in both cases, you'll see the students are included for state funding purposes. In Coppell, it's limited to, uh, they, much like Plano and many other districts, the city boundaries and the district boundaries are not the same. Uh, so they have students that live in the city of Coppell that are not in Coppell ISD, and those are the, the ones that they accept into the district that live out of, uh, out of the school district. Uh, the students, if, as they apply, must have maintained a, uh, and Coppell only does it for elementary students. Uh, the student must have maintained at least a 95% attendance rate. They must have passed all classes the previous year. Uh, they must have passed all sections of the STAR if, if they were in a grade that uh, that applied to. They must not have been placed in a disciplinary program. It is subject to space and staffing availability at, at schools and the parents have to provide the transportation. So that's what Coppell does. They pick up uh, by including those students uh, as theirs for state funding. They get a benefit of probably 72 or $300 a student uh, for each one that comes in. Lovejoy, on the other hand, does charge tuition it ranges from $9,000 to $11,000 a student, uh, depending on what grade they're in. Uh, those students are also included for state funding purposes. And back before Lovejoy had their TRE and went to $1.17, that double dipping, if you want to call it, was very lucrative. They, they could charge nine to eleven thousand dollars for tuition and they picked up about seven thousand dollars in state aid so uh, very helpful to their budget uh, this year it's not going to be as lucrative because as with Plano we've had the, the TRE to get to a dollar seventeen and one of the quirks in the state funding formula says if you do charge tuition those kids work you you in essence get some state funding, but they don't count them in your, uh, they back them out of your weighted average daily attendance when they calculate recapture. And so the benefit that you get from the state pretty well goes away and about all you're left with is the tuition. Uh, so their, their rules are very similar to Lovejoy's, uh, I'm sorry, to Coppell's. Uh, the student must have maintained 95% attendance, passed all classes, passed the STAR, and no disciplinary problems. The district determines which school the student attends, and that would be based on, on staffing and availability, and again, the, the parents have to provide the transportation. Do they accept any higher than elementary grades? Yes. They do? Yeah. My, okay. I, since they have the differentiated tuition, I, I think theirs goes all the way through okay. high school. 
and I really haven't followed it. I didn't look enough to know at Coppell, it seems if the kid first started that in elementary, I'm not sure that when they reach middle school if they tell them sorry, you have to go back to another district. It yeah. seems like they do, but uh, not quite sure about that. So kind of as you think about this, uh, some things to, to think about uh, if you're wanting to do this. First, just uh, think about how this might tie into our district goals of student learning and efficient use of financial resources. Uh, there's kind of some things on both sides of that. As far as student learning, uh, if you do have availability in a, a particular grade and you move some kids in, you may not have any additional cost, but you do increase the class size. Uh, so that's to some extent that would be a negative. Uh, you are required once you, you take those students, they're yours for at least a year. There's, there's no send backs uh, with those students. On the financial resource side, uh, I kind of ran, well, I, not kind of, I ran some numbers with some assumptions for us in Plano. Uh, and basically is for each student that we receive, uh, if we do not charge tuition, we get a net benefit of about $7,444. Let's call it $7,400 in the state funding formula. A lot of that's in a reduction and recapture. Uh, we could not charge the nine to $11,000 that Lovejoy charges. Uh, I won't get into it in a lot of detail, but the law basically says you can only charge them the difference between what you pick up in state aid and what your total expenditures per student are. Uh, Lovejoy, and I believe rightfully so, use their all funds expenditure per student, uh, which had a large debt load in it, and so their total is about 18,000. Ours last year was more like 13,000. So we're probably looking at more in the five to 6,000 range if you wanted to charge tuition. Uh, so I just ran the figures. If you had another student and you charged $5,000, of course you'd get to keep that $5,000 and your net state aid benefit would be around 500. So uh, that's why it's kind of counterintuitive. Actually by charging tuition, you give up more state aid than uh, not more than the, the 5000 you still get a little bit of a benefit, but your net benefit that way is only 5500 compared to the 7400 if you did not charge tuition. Uh, again, it's a very quirky system. Our average, average operating cost per student, excluding recapture, is around $9,100. Uh, certainly, though, when students come in, uh, if you, for instance, if you have, let's say, 81 kindergarten students and you plug another one in, you're still below the 22 to 1 ratio, so uh, your incremental cost could be pretty close to zero in some instances uh, if you're plugging them into a class and it doesn't require an additional teacher. Then some philosophical considerations. Uh, both districts did indicate that uh, there had been some pushback from the residents, uh, the thought of allowing non-resident students to come in and use the, the same facilities uh, and have access to education when they weren't paying property taxes to the district. Uh, and then also, you know, as we talked about it, if, if you had five starting basketball players and there were other kids on the team and somebody that didn't live in the district took one of those spots, there's going to be some pushback from that too or in, or in other academic or extracurricular activities. Uh, so those are just some things to, to think about. Kind of the next steps tonight, we wanted to, to kind of see if there was any consensus on the, any desire for us to continue looking at it. And if so, uh, 
tuition basis or not tuition basis. Uh, it's bad grammar. Non-tuition, tuition free, mm -hmm. not not tuition. Uh, if there is, well then our next step would be to develop some proposed guidelines and procedures. We'd certainly want this to go through a legal review and then bring it back uh, in a few months for formal board action that could be implemented next year if that was the desire of the board. Can I ask a quick question? Um, you said at Cop Hill and Lovejoy both, they um, said they don't take students with a serious infraction on their disciplinary record. What access to that information would PISD have? Is there a record that would be available for us? I mean, you get the star, you can see their star test grade and that sort of thing, but disciplinary? I would defer to someone that knows more about me when it comes to student records for transfer students, <laughs> which could be anyone in the room. <laughs> Possibly, but um, unless the parent disclosed it, we might not know okay. until after they were here with us. Okay. There may be a risk associated with that because there's yep. no definitive, like a start. No, if they had outstanding discipline at the district, then we would know. But if they had discipline history the last year, there would be no way for us to know unless they disclosed that. Steve, we've also talked about the average student, but we would have to accept a child if they met these guidelines, whether they were English language learner, someone taking CTE, someone with special needs. Is that correct? We couldn't discriminate if we opened up our policy. Is that correct? I believe that's why we would ask for the legal review. Uh, I think the very fact that they were these other districts require the student to have passed all parts of the STAR could possibly exclude some special needs students. Susan, did you have something to add to that? Did you have something to add to that? No, I, that's what I was going to say. That, that's what our guess is, that that's how they get around that. Well, <clears throat> we know, I mean, charters often get around it by they, they don't have the teachers, staffing. the staffing, and so they, say well we'd, we'd love to have them but we don't have the teacher set up for that they never intend on having a teacher set up for that so it could also the situation if a child is in elementary and maybe hasn't been tested in areas one might discover one qualifies for certain things and then we're burdened with the cost of providing that without the revenue side to cover that so that has a financial implication upon the other things that I think the district would be doing to meet the needs of the student population that lives in Plano ISD. I'm going to go ahead and just share my opinion. I think we have a lot of work to do for the, was it 51,948 mm -hmm. kids that we have right now. We have so many initiatives going, so many committees going. I just don't think this is something that we should take on at this time. Well, I, as one of the <laughs> ringleaders of this, uh, I, this afternoon, pulled up the, what I think is the latest demographic report. I think it's from June. Uh, Steve, please correct me if I'm wrong. But um, if you look at the numbers from five years ago, we had over 55,000 kids in the district. And, you, you know, in the next couple of years, we're going to dip down to pretty close to 53,000. So somewhere in there and i don't know that what this number is but somewhere in there is a is a maximum capacity and i'm not advocating that we go to that maximum capacity uh, by any means um, in, in any school or district wide but it, it just seems to me that um, even if we go with the no charge or no tuition model that you know that that's sort of like what capel has i believe it, it seems to me as though we would be Uh, just my opinion it seemed to me as though it would be silly not to at least consider the impact of that of bringing in a couple of hundred kids that might you know this and the financial impact is not significant but you know a couple hundred kids that you know that we could we could work with to again because we are in a in a district where we are aging out you know lots of people have gray hair like i do and you know we got kids that are moving to college. We're not replacing them as much as the little bump we we probably will see in kindergarten the next year or two. 
I just think this is something that we should be considering um, for the district. So it's my I, two cents. I think I'd have to say I would almost want to understand the reason behind someone wanting to transfer into Plano ISD because I would typically believe they would live have to live somewhere <laughs> close enough to get to school every day and I feel like we have we're surrounded by very good districts so I would question the reasoning why they're transferring and it would concern me that we don't really have a hundred percent guarantee that we're not receiving a disciplinary problem and that sort of thing I, I agree with Tammy on that on the on the, the fact that we're already focused heavily on all of this <laughs> right I guess valid point I mean will we get a lot of kids from Frisco and Allen probably not right but we have a border with Dallas ISD and I, Riley I would, and and you know I don't want to call it too many others but a handful that in my view are significantly less stellar education that we're providing here in Plano ISD and so I think for the you know that's an opportunity we would out there but you know when, when I was thinking about this I was thinking about the decline in enrollment I was thinking our decline in births within the school district and then I was thinking you know if you if we lost 409 students this year I mean you know we're gonna have to fill those seats that are gonna be open in the future so it may you know the thing is that we should just into it because as the public school climate becomes uh, more competitive lately more districts may take up uh, tuition policies and we should just see the trend and just look into it at least so a couple of comments one um, we need to remember we we're talking about lower enrollment but we need to remember we just went through a uh, small realignment because we got schools that reached capacity uh, and uh, whatever we do we need to think long term and that is are we just kicking the can down the road having said that I, I heard some of the concerns of uh, what are we bringing in but at the same time over the past couple of years uh, there were a few cases where we got uh, parents that moved out of the district but and not far out of the district but wanted to keep their kids in the current schools that they're at or continuing even all the way to graduation so currently we have that for seniors so if you're a senior you can stay in your school and graduate from that school but uh, at other grade levels uh, I mean uh, I would be supportive if uh, at other grade levels we would consider you know they moved out of the district let them continue as long as they'd like we already know those are kids we don't have to worry about uh, what are they bringing from the outside in terms of the disciplinary issues records and everything else we know them so when I think about um, opportunities I go back to our goals as a district and number one is does it lead to improved student learning and the 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 study on the table does not, in my opinion, lead to improved student learning of our student body that lives in Plano ISD. So I put that aside. Next question I ask, is it an efficient use of our financial resources? Given what I've heard, um, this is how I interpret that. It sounds like your objective is to fill empty seats. And all else, because you feel like that would be a positive contributor to financial resources, right? Okay, so there are other variables that complicate that simple objective. Variables like, uh, Steve mentioned, take kindergarten. You have to have a 22 to 1 ratio. You have uh, 21 kids in the class, one comes in, fine, no additional cost um, at that particular school. But if you have 22 and you get number 23, then we have to hire another teacher, and now we've just added $65,000 cost to our bottom line for that grade level. Now, next year, those kids move up to the next grade level. If the same dynamic exists, and that is staffed with a certain number of sections as the one previous, now I've got to add another teacher there. And so that could be another cost load there. Um, so I'm... It's, it's not, to me, as simple as saying, uh, okay, 
let's fill up the empty seats. It's not that simple. It gets far more complicated, especially when they move up, up the system. Um, so that's a concern. Another concern is I think this could lead to some UIL issues, recruiting purpose, you know, talent, uh, making it easier um, for athletically inclined students that might be in other districts like the one that you mentioned coming you know being recruited here for whatever you know purpose I think from an academic competition point of view uh, students let's say um, let's take you know an academically gifted child that comes into the system we get these complaints all the time when someone says well that's not fair you know they're now they're now taking up a spot that could be taken up by one of our kids here so it's just not that simple to me and the the enrollment trend um, is something we're watching we've been watching very closely and we'll continue to watch very closely and the strategy that I would prefer to undertake is related to working with the city to encourage young families to move into our community and by providing perhaps some more senior affordable options um, and some affordable living for young families um, to move into our community. So uh, I understand your objective to improve, you know, simply filling seats but it's it's just to me not that simple and we could be burdening ourselves with more you know FTE cost and with more um, costs associated with the education requirements that that student brings with them that may not be discovered yet so for that for those all those reasons this is not something I agree with Tammy we've got so many other objectives that are, to me, related to student learning that take up uh, the, the priority mm -hmm. for me. This is not on my priority list. And I, I, would, I would be supportive of this if, uh, if the problem of empty seats was much, much higher than it is right now. Yeah. My fear is that Right now, we may have some availability of seats, and then next year, all of a sudden, we're doing a realignment because we reached capacity, because it's, it's not as predictable as we would like it to be, uh, enrollment and moving through the grades. Uh, but, but I think Missy touched on, uh, on an important point. If we go back to what our goals are, what our objectives are, um, it does not improve anything to the students we currently have in the district. That's one. As far as uh, efficient use of uh, of our funding, our financial resources, I think what I'm hearing, whether we do take tuition or not, at best we break even. And um, I don't think that it's going to be until we really reach very low uh, occupation that uh, of, of our classrooms that uh, that this is going to be something that can help financially. It's a potential strategy, yeah. But I think it's it's premature. Too early. Yeah, it's too early. And I think that one example, Yoram, um, this year was talking to Michelle Taylor, who is mm -hmm. the principal at Stinson Elementary, and we've been looking at projections there, yeah. and we've seen available seats in that campus. All of a sudden this year, there's 40 new families at Stinson Elementary. And that is probably, I mean, without knowing the facts behind it, is probably due to the development of City Line, which is in that area that feeds in. So we've got to be careful because if we, I think we might be too early on this. Um, I wouldn't rule it out as a consideration in the future, like you said, if our enrollment continues to decline, but I don't think it's the time for looking at it. Okay, so, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, I, from what it sounds like, and I don't wanna step on your toes, but it sounds like it's not something the board wants to pursue at this, month, at this point, but I wanted to thank Steve and, and team for looking at it, putting together analysis, and then thank my colleagues for having a thoughtful discussion about it. So, thank you. 
Well, I'd like to thank you and Angela. It's something I hadn't really thought of. It was an intriguing notion, and uh, I always, most days I, I know so much I can't learn anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, uh, th to me, kind of seeing the nuances of this talking to Lovejoy and Coppell was very interesting, and it was a, it, it was a little bit of an enjoyable exercise to kind of put some numbers together and look through it. So. Uh, as two brand new board members, that was one of the very first things uh, y'all mentioned when you met with me. I, I, I applaud you for thinking outside the box. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Good thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so our next topic is one that many of you are here to participate in and uh, learn from, and it is a plan of work. So at our last meeting, we talked about some district initiatives. And now at this meeting, we're going to dive in more specifically and uh, staff members are going to be outlining in some level of details uh, those projects that they own in their area. So uh, first, I will turn it over to Dr. Bingley for a moment and then he will turn it over to Sarah Bonser. I will indeed. Thank you, President Bender and Board of Trustees. As you will recall at our last board meeting, uh, three district initiatives were adopted by the board. Uh, at the time we had discussion, the two of those actually uh, we had shared uh, some detail in a, in a board cabinet retreat earlier in the summer. But at that previous board meeting, the D district administration indicated that we would bring more detailed information to the board about the 2017-2018 plans, which we are calling the plan of work. So uh, please note that this goal, this plan does not include all the ongoing work of the district as it is reflective of new goals and actions in the 17-18 school year. Uh, in addition, student achievement goals, which are set by the district-based improvement committee, are scheduled to be presented to the board at a later meeting. So um, I'll just offer up that uh, Ms. Bonzer and our cabinet have uh, done a phenomenal job really attacking uh, this uh, plan of work effort and, and it has uh, been a lot of conversation in our cabinet meetings and we're uh, pretty proud of where it has come. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah Bonzer. Thank you, Dr. Bingley. Uh, each department this evening will present their plan of work as it relates uh, to how they will contribute to the accomplishment of board goals and district initiatives as well as some departmental initiatives. We'll follow the order that you see on the slide uh, above on the screen and the administrator will give a summary of their area and then we'll leave time for the board to ask questions uh, so we won't read through every, every uh, page of your <laughs> handout. Um, we'll save you from that. And each cabinet member has approximately 15 minutes. Um, and of course, you know, we can give or take time as we need, but you know, we understand that uh, you know, we don't wanna stay all night tonight, but we sure do wanna give uh, time to all the questions that you may have. In order to facilitate the process, we will leave this slide on the screen um, as we go through the goals and the plans for the year. As you can see on this slide, we've aligned the work to the two district goals of improved student learning and efficient use of resources. We've aligned the district initiatives, commitment to equity, innovative learning, mission-driven culture, and special education, as well as some student learning department goals under the student learning district goal. And then for resources, we actually started to break it down a little further into uh, which area of resources uh, were, we, were we specifically looking at addressing uh, how we're using in the district. And so you can see on the slide um, how we broke those down in the plan. Uh, in addition, uh, they're color coded so that when you look at your plan, whatever color the box is, that's what it ties back to. So you can start to see uh, the alignment on your, on your pages. And so um, please feel free to ask questions as we go. I, I hate to think you're gonna hold them all till the end uh, because we have the whole team presenting. Um, and at this time, if there's no questions about the format, we'll kick this off. And Dr. Katrina Hasley, uh, the Assistant Superintendent for Academic Services will start us off. 
Thank you, Ms. Bonser, Dr. Bingley, and Board of Trustees. I'm very excited tonight to present to you the goals for the Academic Service Department. And I'd like to start off by saying that I'm very proud of my team for all of the collaborative, strategic, um, thoughtful work that went into creating these goals. And I'm sure that every cabinet member would echo the same for their team. And again, I'll mention what Dr. Bingley said that this is just part of our work. It's really kind of the new work in addition to all that we do throughout the year, our ongoing support of teachers in the classroom and student learning. So, so you see that Academic Services has two pages of goals. And on the first page, uh, the color coding shows the top half um, is tied to our commitment to equity initiative. And these go, I'm not going to read through every box, I'm just kind of summarize in general our department goals and then you, of course you're free to ask questions, that's why I've got our team here if there are questions I can't answer. Um, the goals in the top part on our commitment to equity really are focused on increasing access and participation of students from underrepresented groups to things and opportunities such as advanced academics, robotics, dual language, and also we have some work on our Future Industries Academy that are mentioned. The bottom part of the page, which is the, the blue boxes, um, these have to do with supporting our department goal, which is the student learning. And these are really focused on our increasing our blended learning, um, dual credit expansion, extending the BLAST program from the elementary, including the, middle, the elementaries that feed into that middle, those middle schools. And also there we have a commitment to improving our response to intervention model as a district. So on the second page of academic services, you see almost the whole page is dedicated to our initiative for special education. And of course, that also is tied to the district goal of improving student learning. I'm just going to interrupt for a moment. Sure. At what point should we interject the questions when the summary slide? As soon as she's, I think as soon as Dr. Hesley summarizes her areas, then we'll just open it up okay. to the board yeah. questions. I think I'm the only one with two pages of goals, so. <laughs> um, you can see that our special education goals are really focused on basically three areas. Talking about safety, building staff capacity, and then improving our processes and staffing models. So you can see that we're also, we have a goal there about working with a consultant. We have an excellent consultant working with us to really design short-term and long-term plans. Um, that will help us take steps to prioritize the work that we need to do with our special education programs. Some of these goals, of course, are going to take time beyond this school year, and um, this will be ongoing work that will be required. And then our last goal at the bottom for the department is um, tied to the effective, e efficient use of resources, and that's our, we're revising our curriculum management system, redesigning that so that it's more robust and more user-friendly for the teachers in the classroom. So that's a little overview of our two pages. So do you have any questions for us? Yes, I'd like to know when all three senior highs will have a robotics team. Amy Bates will come and help with that question. Thanks so much for the question. We have FRC Robotics at Plano Senior and at the Academy High School, and we have an FTC team both at Plano West and at Plano East. When will they both have the, the first robotics, the big one? When those campuses feel that they are ready in terms of facilities and staffing to do that. Hey, I'm going to be pushy here because there's no reason that the kids at East and West shouldn't have that opportunity right now. If we don't have a staff member at those two campuses that wants to do that, I'm sure there are lots of wonderful educators all over North Texas that would be happy to join the PISD family. So we've heard this now for a couple of years. Those kids are ready. So we need to make sure our staff is ready too. It's just not fair. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Okay, I was sure that that's what Tabby was going to bring up, but uh, if she doesn't, I will bring it up. I noticed that you want to add four classes, uh, four dual enrollment classes. What, what's preventing us from bringing this number up, much up, much higher than four more? It's Dr. Thibodeau. And that was my next one, Yoram. 
and which classes they're bringing. You, you flip the order. Good evening. Nothing, actually. So we feel str strongly that we can commit to four. We're having some good conversations with Collin College and are interested in seeing what, what we can do with that number. Because okay. I understand Colin has 30 hours of credit available to high school students. They, they do, and we've added the math program this year, so we added that one, and it's really just a matter of our continuing our conversations with them. Yes. Which classes are we adding? Because all math is not created equal. The math courses, we added the higher level math, so the terminal course, which is uh, differential equations and the partner to that differential equations course. So it's, they're both uh, combined or the, a terminal course beyond what we offered. Mm -hmm. As much as I would love to see differential equations in high school, I'm concerned about the kids who are not uh, comfortable in their test taking skills. So an AP class is not the best option for mm -hmm. them. So is there an opportunity to actually bring the first year of calculus, which is what our kids do with calculus um, AB, and have that in a Collin College form. I will go back and add that to my notes for our next conversation with them, which is coming up in less than two weeks. So, Lisa, yes, um, is the model that you're exploring uh, for expansion uh, a continuation of the existing model that we have, wherein they use adjunct professors to deliver on our campus? No, we're actually looking at using our own teachers on our own campuses. So we were able to complete a really nice analysis of that last year to see exactly how many teachers we really had available. We have quite a few. Our teachers have some uh, really great degrees that align to the call-in requirements. And so I think there's a, definitely an opportunity to bring that back onto the campus, let our teachers teach those courses. Are we looking at some science courses, some good biology, that type of thing, where a, a student will be able to get their first year of college done while they're still in our schools? We are looking at science courses. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to specifically be biology. Yes. Well, the ones that would be useful would be biology, yes. chemistry, kind of the core courses. Exactly. We agree. I think if you look at the Collin College has a uh, cooperation agreement has several cooperation agreements with other colleges for transfer classes and if we can find what of those transfer classes can they take here that that would I mean having a kid coming out of here straight into second year that'd be great that would help third. a lot of families the yes. what? that would help a lot of families we agree yes. and, and I'm sure there's a financial component to all of that mm -hmm because uh, along with, I know you'll expand as many as you can successfully. I, 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 we will, know, yes. I know that you will do that. Uh, accompanying that is the concern that I have about books and the access to that and the cost of the courses um, so that the children that you're thinking about have access to it without, um, it, there are all kinds of issues because it's, in secondary, families don't want to sign up for free and reduced lunch and they're, they're just unknowingly excusing themselves from access to the free tuition that comes with it. So, you know, I'm sure you'll look at the financial thing too, yes. but I don't want to just assume that it's, okay, enroll in that clunky process. I hate that well, process. That's, yeah. It's so that's difficult. I know they try to make it easier, but it's just still so hard. <laughs> So we, we, with the math course that we added this year, we did um, add for the very first time that we would be responsible for the books, for the students for that. Fantastic. And we did that um, for one reason, because math textbooks are so very expensive. Also, to really see um, how, we, how well we predict enrollment, which we did a pretty great job at, and then how far we could push our agreement with Colin to ensure that we could continue to use the same text that um, we all agree on for multiple years. Instead of how you sometimes will, students will not even have the same book the next semester. And so that agreement's been great. Our Health Science Academy has done a lot to forge that relationship because they use uh, the same books for multiple years and have built that into their MOU as well, which we're, um, Dr. Hasley and I just looked at today and we're hoping to make some conditions like that also in the future. 
Yes. Well, Lisa, I know last year when we had this conversation, Missy described that clunky process. Yes. And I think there was discussion that it was getting better. Have we been able to smooth that pathway? Yes, I'm sorry, I know Jana Hancock couldn't be here tonight, but she has worked through Campus Services and with Mark Allen to um, add some additional counseling options on the campuses for our students. Uh, Collin College is providing those positions for us, and we think that's gonna make the world of difference yeah. for our students having access to enrollment. I think you guys are on the right track, so I'm really glad. I think all of us you're hearing are really excited and glad to see expansion. Yeah, if, if the board remembers, they've made good on their promise for those embedded guidance counselors, and that, that, is, that is really make, making a difference. As Sarah will tell you, this was actually a little bit before Dr. Hasley came on when I came back from meeting with Neil Matkin, and, uh, you know, where he, he just really uh, had some agreement that we can, our teachers, and some of the things that have been impediments, he was very amenable to let's let's tear those barriers down and and let's get after this. So <laughs> Sarah and I started drawing on on uh, on a notepad and and all the way through Collin College onto four year institutions. So we, there there could be significant change. As much as we can do and do well, right. this could this could look very different very soon. Well, and I, I think we have to remember the um, course the course selection process of when. Uh, when we have to have information available to students who are going to enroll in the fall. So the work that we do for the offerings for 1819 have to be completed rather early in the process. November, and, yes. And so the commitment on what is actually getting in there now versus where we can continue to keep growing that, you know, we'll get it, four is the minimum, more if we can, and then a bigger plan uh, is, is something to kind of keep on the, so are you pursuing a, like a class that's called, it's a dual credit class, or are you at all exploring that it's an AP and a dual credit class? So there's some limitations we didn't expect with the AP dual credit combined courses. So um, similar to what Ms. Bonds are saying, we are looking forward to an opportunity to add courses like that. I don't think that we'll be bringing those forward in November. I know Northside ISD offers those sort of classes, yes. so if you want to look to them as a best practice, that would be a good opportunity. We We're also a large, highly diverse district. We'll be talking with them Friday. Yes. Okay, sorry to grill you. <laughs> they produce amazing But it's graduates. all good. Oh, it's all good news. I have something. Yes. I, to change the topic a little bit. Um, I looked over your adult transition center that you were designing. Will this also give the opportunity for a uh, the adults to do some off-campus experiences because even though we're building this on-campus vocational training and uh, community-based vocational opportunities on the campus will they be able to go on the on the bus and go over to Collin, Collin College also oh, this is a question for our special ed department so uh, Sandy or Sure, will you, will you be offering also some off-campus experiences for the students for the Adult Transition Center? Absolutely, okay. yes. That's just their base. We plan for them to be in the community working as well as doing activities. So you'll be teaching them to get a bus compared to the uh, Collin College? Uh, Collin College right now allows us a space to okay. use during the day for one of our adult transition programs. They have informed us that that space will not be available to us next year. So our students that are, that are currently located there will come to the Transition Center. But again, it's just a base. It's not where they stay all day. Yeah. And yes, we do transportation training through DART and paratransit. You know, Ms. Powell, that was one of the things that when you look for these transition centers, you want them near public transportation because ultimately there's, that's a teachable skill that we have to be able to access public transportation. Um, and, and in the transition centers that I've seen in the past, wherever the kids work, you can replicate some of the things that they are having to do in that work environment. So that back at the transition center, we are always, am I right on that? We are reinforcing 
That's why there might be kitchen skill. There might be, you know, we're reinforcing the things they have to take back to the job setting with them. All the, that, that's what I've seen in transition. Yes, centers. and one of the things that, that's a huge goal of us is that we're going to work with community businesses to allow us to, to establish um, assimilation training so the student could learn how to do it in our transition center and then take those skills and move to the real business and, and implement those skills there. Okay. Well, thank you, Sandy, for that explanation. Uh -huh. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Hasley? Okay. Thank you. All right, I feel bad because I only had three. Uh, you can still ask a lot of questions. Yeah. That's right. So I'm going to try to slow talk through these. Uh, no, actually, and I think that last question that Angela asked was a, a just a good reminder. So much of what uh, facilities and finance does is more in a support role. So. Uh, we were involved in the purchase of the building that we use for the transition center. We'll be uh, involved uh, late next spring when the, the current uh, occupant, my possibilities, moves out of it. We'll be involved in getting it ready. So uh, just a sign of how all the different departments uh, interact with each other. And our, that may not be one of our goals, but that's certainly something that we'll be involved with. Uh, and you'll see that in, in a lot of these other uh, areas as well. The three that, that we listed uh, are really, uh, two of them in particular, really ongoing things. Uh, one of the big things is just the continual uh, implementation of the bond program, staying within timelines and within the allocated budgets. Uh, I counted up, well, actually, during the 2017-18 fiscal year from July this past July through June, we'll have at least 30 projects in that bond program that uh, will be in some different stages. Some of them we're completing this summer. Uh, others will we're doing the planning on right now, and then uh, there'll be some that late next spring or early next summer we'll be selecting architects on to begin more of the planning on those. So uh, that, that's a that, that's a very big project and uh, and goal that we'll continue to. Uh, work with it relates to the facilities item uh, on the chart. Another item or another goal that we have that relates to the facilities is uh, it, it harkens back to the the two hell storms that we had in the spring of 2016. Uh, we had over 26 projects in progress as we entered July of this year and there'll be 28 more schools or other district facilities that will start work on in uh, the current year and then the final phase will be in 2018-19. As we work through that, we do it in a systematic manner. Uh, we try to do the, the big roof replacements to the extent we can in the summer uh, and then the more minor repairs which are least disruptive to the learning environment, we try to uh, take care of those during the school year. We can't do everything in the summer but we try uh, to the extent possible to uh, to have the least disruption that we can. The third goal that we have uh, is in the category of risk on your chart, and it's more in the financial area instead of the facilities area. The district has had uh, lots of good procedures in place for many years in this district, uh, but they weren't really accessible in one comprehensive procedures manual that the schools could use. And so we've just, uh, in fact, today, Linda's group has put the finishing touches on the, uh, the fiscal procedures manual. Uh, from this point, in the next month or so, we'll be training the principals on that, and then the following month, the office managers. So this is something that will be fully implemented by December. Uh, kind of like your policy manual, it's something that will never be complete. We'll always be refreshing it as we go forward, but I think it will be a big boost to the schools and it's uh, something we're doing in conjunction with a recommendation from the district's internal auditor that uh, I think will serve us well for years to come. So that's our three main goals moving into 17-18.
Steve, I'm really happy to see that the contractor for the fourth early childhood school will be selected before you ride off into the sunset. So I'm looking forward to that in November. So thank you. Um, also, I have a question. Uh, remind me which of the four middle schools are receiving a fine arts edition. Uh, Armstrong is the uh, is one of them. It's the outlier. The other three are what we call the triple schools because they had basically the same floor plan. That would be Frankfurt, Renner, and Rice. Okay, good. So I've gotten some comments about when the temporary behind Renner is going to disappear. So when we yeah when we add and expand that fine arts facility. Uh, and I, so I guess we had the timing on that. It'll. Uh, okay, selecting the contractor next spring, and so hopefully work on that beginning uh, during the next school year. Okay, thank you. And I'm. I wanted to understand a little bit better about the Williams High School refurbishment. I didn't think there was anything in this bond for that. Uh, we wanted to put some type of architectural study, and we were told that we couldn't based on bond rules, but we were going to get money out of our operating budget or our, um, our rainy day fund and look at what it would really t cost to remake that and not just keep putting lipstick on the pig. Uh, so my comments on that would be there was $4 million in the bond program just for some basic yeah refurbishments, whether it's you know, repainting, flooring, finishings, kind of uh, <coughs> something along the lines that we did at Gulledge and Hager and we're going to do it for other elementary schools. Uh, we also had some money for Jasper, for Wilson, for Bowman. Uh, so we did allocate some money that wasn't really scoped out yet. Uh, there are some other things that we're doing at the same time uh, in addition to that, which may include, uh, for instance, some work on the bleachers at the football field there at Williams. Uh, so as we've done with many of the projects, we'll try to pull all that together and have a bigger package that we'll end up hiring a contractor for. My thinking on, on Williams as we move forward is that when we do hire the architect for that project, part of that is to put together some work now, but part of it, uh, if, if they can do it at the same time, I think we can fit it in under the same project, but have them kind of give us a long range idea of, you know, do we need to spend tens of millions of dollars overhauling that school or is it time potentially in the next decade to look to buy some land build something or even if we could build on that land as we've done with uh, Meadows, Mendenhall and Memorial, it might be time to go ahead and build a whole new school and that might be more cost efficient. So really two things working there. One is more for the three or four year horizon and that's doing some refreshes there, uh, but also looking long term at, at what our long term plan is for that facility. Does that help? It does, and I'm highly supportive of doing something pretty dramatic there. It's, it's a big piece of property, I would think, and that's not our largest 910 school by a long right. shot anymore. So we should be able to do something that would accommodate. I just think that those neighborhoods, those kids deserve something better. We've kind of done our best sort of patching it over the years, but isn't that building more than 50 years old? 51. <laughs> so it, it's lived a good life. Uh, <laughs> I could ask Linda Madden. <laughs> because I believe she went to high school <laughs> in that building back when it was Plano High School. And it was way before she ever went to high school. <laughs> so do you know what year? It, it did celebrate 50 years just a couple of years ago. I, I, went to, I remember going to celebration because I yeah. went there too. So about well, 55, 56 years old at this point. By yeah. the next bond issue, it will be right at 60 years old, or by the next bond election. Well, I not that that's completely young in mm -hmm. people years, but for a building, yeah. it's uh, a long the tooth. Like well, and in, in that community, we, I mean, with we have a track record of having done that for some of the, for some of our very oldest elementary schools, where it was just more economical and a provided a lot more functionality to just replace the school rather than continuing to uh, to refurbish it every few years. Yeah. And I think 
you know, look at what we're doing with Shepton High School right now. And that was a, I know that kiddos that went to Williams thought Shepton was a palace. So <laughs> it's probably time yeah. to be looking at a, a, a total gut job. Yeah, I would, I would look for it in the, the next bond proposition to probably be one of our, our larger projects, uh, whether it's a brand new facility or a, a major redo. Thank you. Okay, if that concludes the questions for Steve, we will now move on to campus services. And Ms. Monset. Thank you. Um, I'll start this evening with uh, highlighting our goals around social emotional learning, which uh, actually are department goals, but tie also to the district goal of closing the achievement gap and um, improve student learning. Um, and I know you're familiar with some of the work that um, this committee took on last year, and you'll be hearing a progress report next month. Um, but this work really came about as from a variety of sources as we looked at um, both our discipline data and overrepresentation of minority students, um, increased reporting of student stress and uh, lack of coping skills, um, helping campuses um, learn to create a sense of community with very diverse student populations. So our goal this year will be largely focused on implementation um, and that will involve professional learning for administrators and teachers as well as realigning some of our guidance and counseling lessons to reflect the um, social emotional learning standards. Just as a subset of that, I would um, point out the additional work that's being done in suicide prevention and of course say that um, our, our primary work around that is building environments that are safe and welcoming for students and um, helping students create healthy self-images and strong coping skills being aware of what resources there are in the community before they ever get to a point of um, considering harming themselves. But in addition to that work, we are doing some very focused work around suicide prevention. And um, I know you're aware of the partnership with UT Southwestern uh, through our health classes. Also, we are continuing with parent presentations um, through the Halliburton Foundation to raise awareness around mental health, continue with our staff training, particularly with our guidance counselors, and then um, a highlight this year, we will, we will really launch this idea of PACT, which is Plano acknowledges, cares, and tells, and um, be working with students kindergarten through 12th grade on what that means, um, trying to make that very much in the forefront so students and families are aware and we're hopeful uh, we'll be extending some um, outreach to Plano the city of Plano and some of the partners uh, around mental health in hopes that we can move that even beyond the school district uh, next in our commitment to equity work and improve student learning um, again you're very aware of most of these initiatives we are in the successful uh, first month of launch with Huffman and uh, their road to IB PYP the staff is um, trained curriculum for fall semester has been written um, integrating both state standards and then the IB profile and uh, learning outcomes parent outreach has begun and will continue throughout the year both with the Huffman community and then HOAs um, that feed into Huffman um, will be assigned a IBO consultant this month and that will really start our work in receiving feedback and um, some status on how we're progressing and then we'll be able to give you an update in June on that working on the design for the fourth early childhood school um, this year is largely around the facility design and um, 
where we we and the architects have worked to really look at what facility impact there is with our Head Start program, um, as well as our early childhood schools and other facilities that they've built so that we're, we feel confident that the floor plan will allow for expanded services um, for both parents and students. This year we'll begin to look at what the feeder pattern uh, proposal that we would want to bring to you would be and also um, a study into after school programming there and then again as you're aware we're uh, beginning <coughs> to work on weighted grade point average and um, we'll be forming both the work group and then um, some profile for the advisory group so that in March we can bring you uh, recommendation we have several goals that relate to um, being a learning and mission driven organization and I would say that in general we're looking at a continuum of intentional learning for our campus administrators um, really beginning with teacher leaders who have an interest in becoming a leader perhaps beyond their campus um, and then cultivating the leadership that we have in our, in our assistant principals, getting them ready for the next step, supporting our brand new principals, uh, additionally through some principal mentoring this year, and then helping to organize our principals around communities of practice where well, they will have some opportunities to self-select common goals that they're, they're uh, developing through their appraisal process and network with other principals and then finally uh, we have a couple of goals related to the efficient use of resources um, again I know you're aware of the third employee child care center we have done um, the first tour of that and have compiled a list of repairs and improvements that need to be done immediately if we're going to try to do a soft opening in January um, we are also in the process of assessing whether we have a level of interest from our current employees to have a soft opening in January or whether we'll um, need to wait and just do a full opening um, next August and then we're working with um, human resources to develop hiring practices for campus administrators as well as working with our internal audit reports on campuses that had insufficient audits last year either in an area of financial um, the financial area or their climate survey and that will also be part of principal goal setting this year uh, Susan under uh, principal mentoring and, and maybe even beyond that um, I remember last year we had, uh, this was an elementary school and uh, you had the teacher here and the uh, principal and a student and they were, was it Mendenhall that built the garden? Meadows. 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 Starts with an M, I was close. Um, and I remember when, when we talked about that, uh, that, that another trustee asked uh, what, what is the funding that's required and, uh, but, but it really comes down to the culture the culture that that principal had that that school had and in my tours of schools I, I can see I can tell the different the differences in culture um, I, I would like that to be part of uh, the mentoring process how do you build a culture of creativity in in schools because it's it starts with the principal it goes to the teachers and it goes to the students and that's what they get yep, certainly um, the the concept of culture is is a strand that's built in throughout the the idea of culture around creativity is something that um, I'll, I'll take notes of and we'll look at implementing that as well the, the, I can tell you and, and this this from personal experience and, and research that uh, autonomy more autonomy and less bureaucracy those are the two biggest things uh, th there's obviously more and there's more uh, granularity to even those two words but um, 
you know, when you compare what happens on different airlines uh, and, and you see that there is one airline that really stands out because of a different culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's how I'd like to see our schools too. And, it, and it's up to us to do it. Of course, I'm tremendously excited about the work that's happening in Huffman and I hope the communications meetings with the parents went well. What I'm looking forward to is that backflow that I'll start to get communication from my community saying we've heard these things are happening. And I really challenge you to um, try to re-engage that entire community. There are some amazing people who care about kids a lot. I mean, a couple examples that you all know, Joe Amunds, Jean Callison, they were the PTA moms of Huffman Elementary. And I think you can get us all back. And we should use that, that resource. So please don't be afraid to ask. Uh, second, I'm going to invite you all to the Huffman Kindergarten soccer game this Saturday. It's going to be a grudge match because there are actually two Huffman Kindergarten teams. Um, there's Huffman Royal and Huffman Gold because there were that many kids who were interested. I think my husband's going to run back and forth from the different sides because he's the coach of both. But it'll be uh, this Saturday at 11 Archgate B, which is just south of Jasper. So that's so my commercial. Th does he have a conflict of interest? He may, he may, or it may be he has a co-coach, Danny Ken. I don't know if they're going to separate different sides for this, but it, but it's going to be fun. And just seeing that community come together, people who didn't know each other before coming together, pooling their money to do the snacks, deciding they're only going to be healthy snacks, no sugary stuff. It's been it's been great to see. Um, so thank you for that that important work. Um, second, of course, I'm very excited about the, the fourth early childhood school and whatever we can do to engage the community and partners. I think the after school programming is extraordinarily important. I, I still am hopeful that we'll get folks of known like Boys and Girls Club who would want to participate and, and really leverage the partnerships because it's going to take all of us. It's, as a district, we can't do it by ourselves and so whatever we can do to continue to reach out to those community folks is very important, so thank you. I would just add if um, if you have any influence with Boys and Girls Club, um, there seemed to be a real interest when we yes. met mm -hmm. in that. I'm not sure why. That's Wayne. I have some. I, I think we'll talk later. Their strategy may have changed slightly, but uh, we need to sort understand if that's the, really the case or not. We are designing the facilities so that um, the there is storage area, at a nice storage area um, in the multi-purpose room and kind of around the idea that we would be able to partner, if not with them, perhaps someone else. But I, I think the facility will accommodate that well. Thank you. I, I just think real quickly, Susan, uh, all of us had uh, a meeting today with our student advisory group. and. Uh, as it relates to immensely positive things coming from that as it, with regard to social emotional we we had one of our high school students who told us look I, I've I've already met with my counselor and and that was very meaningful for her and and uh, and then we had another uh, high school student who gives her time down at Centennial Elementary and saw a teacher engaging with kids in, in, in really what is that circle time and it's about how are we going to work with each other how are we you know have will have empathy how will support she said I started crying and and she she said how good will they be as human beings I, I mean this was a high school student who grasped what was happening at the elementary school and how much that was going to make a difference for them as they continued on. It was it was a great uh, afternoon for sure. I love the fact that we're using one curriculum because in the past I heard so many presentations by each principal doing their own survey, their own study. This is such a more efficient way to do this and you'll have this shared language even as kids go from school to school, school to middle school. I love the little stuffed animals on their tummies as they were learning to yeah, breathe so deeply. Yeah, that was cute. So cute. You may have to get me one. <laughs> okay. All good? All right. Communications is next. Thank you. Um, I have a, a few to share with you as well, and I'm not going to go in the exact order that they appear on the page, 
uh, we've already had some of the conversation in prior board meetings, so I'm going to I'm going to hang with you briefly, but you may have questions for me. Um, in regard to uh, improvement in student learning, although most of ours fall under the other goal, we do have a couple there. Um, in regard to the core store and the strategic plan, you've recently heard reports about that. In regard to student learning with the core store, our primary focus there right now is to find a permanent home, and there's been a lot of conversation about the transition center, whether that's an ideal option or not, but that's still something under discussion. That would definitely tie into student learning in that regard and also finding a, a good place and a good home um, that would not be dependent on loan space. So that's one thing that I would bring to your attention again. Um, strategic plan, we covered that at the beginning of the meeting, so I won't spend much time on that since you, you've all gotten that and we've um, since approved the vendor this evening. In regard to our student recognition plan uh, that we're developing for the board, we've already tested a couple of pieces of that at our last board meeting. Um, I'll, you'll be receiving that and, and by way of information, I would say um, just in the, in the next week. We feel like we fleshed out a good plan there and again, we've already tested a couple of things to find out it'll take a few tweaks and scripting and such but I think we've got that down where um, hopefully it'll meet all of your expectations and I'll look forward to your feedback on that um, going down to those goals that affect the efficient use of resources that's primarily where we were mine primarily fall under information and I would I would like to uh, offer appreciation to our staff and our department it was really um, it was very hands-on for all of us to come together. One employee mentioned that it was it was very family-like the way that we worked through each of these together and had great conversation, and that's that's never a bad thing. So that was that was a good opportunity for conversation for us that sometimes isn't always afforded. So thank you um, for that nudge. The communication plan is is very solidly underway, uh, working exclusively with our staff to ultimately. Um, also include a board communication plan which is listed also uh, there as a goal so right now we're focusing on our own staff resources but um, calling as much information as we can from others uh, to put something really really pleasing to both hit our district communication plan as well as our board communication plan in regard to transparency I certainly would um, offer appreciation and thanks to our school board for really being the nucleus I think uh, resting with that with our board uh, broadening that reach in regard to that message. Certainly other districts are signing on and ready to help, uh, but I do feel like that responsibility and those kudos go to our Plano ISD Board of Trustees for sort of initiating that, and our staff is, is the behind the scenes developers of some of those. So we anticipate that continuing and also building the breadth of the message and getting the, um, the truth information, the true information out about education funding and the use of tax dollars so there's a little plug for that program already speaking of commercial um, we're also beginning um, I would say in its infancy a staff and cabinet study of the idea of constituent services so uh, we are early in that stage but looking forward to working toward that through um, the Center of Reform for School Systems and that's something that all of our board members are, are uniquely familiar with and so I look forward to that work as well um, website um, certainly it's launched it's not over it will always be going a step further and a step further a lot of training is happening now and that will continue our department is largely responsible for that however technology still is there is there as our partner and um, to, co to commend them certainly not myself but the team that really tactically worked on the website uh, Missy mentioned it at one of our last board meetings but to their credit uh, we recently were noted a national award for our website so we we want to continue getting that kind of acclaim for that but also make sure it's first and foremost uh, rather than national that it's serving our local community so that truly is our focus and I wanted to reinforce that um, one of the pieces that I will add last it's uh, housekeeping is a term that comes to mind because it's been on our mind for quite some time um, but also the advancing of our systems and how we do things as a volunteer management system um, we're, we're headlong into that already and um, are hoping to bring a recommendation after a bit more research and to determine what uh, budget for that would be and also who all has a, a piece of that pie and who would be best served and the best management of that but I feel like we're very close if I could before while we're talking about awards before questions just to let the board know I was probably going to put it in an update and probably still will but 
we did receive word for our core store that we have been accepted yes, in the thank you. Kids in Need Foundation, which is going to be a huge deal. Um, we reach the line, that next they, level at the junior level that will then, no other doors can open for us until we achieve that level. So uh, thank you, Dr. Bingley, for mentioning that because they, that was a nice hurdle that we cleared. They will begin to funnel <clears throat> resources into our core store in a, in a big way. Well, I have to give you a shout out in your department for the, I think it was ABC Morning News. Oh, local, yes. Mm -hmm. um, story about the core store, and Jean Callison was the talent there, but um, that was good press. <laughs> and we'll take that. <laughs> we consider that earned media. Um, any questions for me before I pass that along? I and thank you for the shout outs. Yes, ma'am. I do have a question about the, the recognition for students. I, I guess I don't really remember that conversation in much depth with the, reception, with the exception of us talking about um, GPA and rankings and so forth. And I, I'd still like to put out that we have some of the most under-recognized students who are so high achieving, I think, in the state. And so I would like us to broaden the children we recognize. I would think you wouldn't have to win a state or national award to actually get some recognition from Plano ISD. There, there are lots of other large districts, I think, that have broader programs. And so I would, I would really push for that. We've got great kids. And this is not about giving a ribbon to everybody who shows up. It's about recognizing the great work that our kids do. So I, I'm hoping we can do more of that, not less of that. I agree. I think we have the best kids ever. Um, finding the appropriate ways to bring them to you. The recognition plan that I'm referring to really pertains more to our Board of Trustees. and. Um, our regular meetings and how we include students not only groups but also individual students so that's what you'll see in the draft plan that again we've already started implementing to some degree uh, and make sure that it meets your standards there but we've also done as a part of building that plan research for their campuses to find out about their recognition ceremonies or how they intend to do that as well so we'd like to sh show you the depth of that and then start from there for building it any further Maybe so we'll be bringing it forward to do some benchmarking with what other large districts do just so our kids are not basically Olympians without notice so does this plan uh, implement pretty much everything that was recommended by the PR firm that we hired no part of it some, on the way. some ideas I think you'll find um, either to be similar or um, maybe like-minded mm -hmm. but but I can't say largely no there are some pieces that you might recognize, but otherwise it, it, it primarily comes from what your priorities you've shared with me as a board mm -hmm. and conversation with our leadership and then with our own department. So one, one of the things that, that you know is an emphasis for me is the communication with the public, with uh, right. our constituents. The and engagement. I see uh, quite a few of uh, those elements here and I have seen uh, over the last couple of months, I've seen a significant improvement in how we communicate and how we collect input from uh, from the public, and I'm I'm hearing that from people too. It's a whole new year. Yeah. Okay, so uh, since I'm one of the board members who've worked so closely with your department on all the transparency stuff, I want to thank everyone in your department for being a great uh, team player and always. Uh, just pitching in immediately and that that goes to Steve too because you're always all of you are having to respond very quickly and um, you guys are, are leading this effort um, and others are watching and they're they're gonna follow your lead so thank you very much all right thank you Carla now district services dr. Cooper I'll give proper wait time tonight versus at the board meeting I learned I'm a quick learner <laughs> thank you a um, couple of our I'm, I'm not going to touch on every one in, in great detail but a couple of the the actions out of district services out of the department are fairly straightforward and you can look through those and ask questions here in a little while the uh, professional learning Piece that will take care of our fans and transportation departments employee services will will cover that so I uh, appreciate their efforts with the, the groups that are outside the instructional realm um, also safety and security Joe Parks went over those items during the last board meeting so those those are uh, have been touched on and what I'd like to to discuss 
are the two specific areas on, one of them is our return to learn efforts, and then the other is on our, our baseline uh, testing efforts and give you a little bit of a little bit of information on what we've tried to do and spent an extensive amount of time this summer and it, it really that whole teamwork for excellence things I, I can't I think at least 10 different departments and all over the district and that have given input including campus principals but what uh, Basically what we're trying to do is have been trying to strengthen the efforts with the communication and this the application piece with the concussion topic back when kids enter the classroom. It's one thing to follow the return to play process that the UIL provides us, but we got to remember the rest of the day they're in class and there's some things that we, we can really strengthen. Not that there were some gaping holes, but campuses were giving a very good faith effort and, and, and also doing a good job, but there, this is, um, and hearing even from them along the way, it's like, you know, this is good that we're kind of doing the same thing, or at least a similar, similar process as, uh, as a student sustains one of those types of injuries. I want to give you a quick example. If a, if a student should sustain a pretty significant physical injury, let's say they, they fractured their arm in two or three places, and they walk into a campus, they're gonna have a cast probably from their fingertips to their, uh, probably uh, just below their shoulder, and it's a, it's a pretty visible process, and people are gonna say, okay, you know, we need, we need to put some things in place. We're probably gonna give you an elevator pass if we're in a two-story building. We're gonna give you a hall pass, keep you out of crowded hallways. Um, you're gonna need buddy notes because you obviously can't write. What kind of, uh, your writing assignments, we've gotta make some accommodations. So just those, those plans start taking place with the, ro the proper staff members at the campuses and then parent involvement, teacher awareness, those things are already going on w on our campuses and mostly through, the, through kind of the commit format. So what we want to do is make sure that we are folding in those students as they sustained a concussion so that they immediately, but, but once again, at the, the cast is invisible. The, the concussion is an invisible process or injury. And what we've done from a communication standpoint and, and hopefully strengthening that, and once again, this is with a lot of input from a lot of people and, and, and appreciate everybody uh, giving that practical information. But as a student potentially comes into a campus, it's not necessarily they're going to go talk to their athletic trainer or their coach. They might, but they might not. So what we're trying to have tried to create as we started the school year is the student walks in, if they come in late and they come into the attendance clerk in the middle of second period and it's like, you know, okay, I'm, I'm, I need a pass to get the second period. Oh, okay, well, here you go. By the way, you know, where you been? Well, I, I got hurt in an activity last night and I, I just got back from the doctor having a concussion. So as soon as the concussion term is mentioned, that attendance clerk, they know there's two points of contact. It's going to be the, the campus nurse and then the principal designee. We were very intentional on the principal designee piece to leave some discretion at the campuses because that's going to look very different from a middle school to a senior high based upon just staffing and, and different what they call different positions. Um, so that those no, the notification of those two people will get, get the ball rolling to make sure that that, that student's needs are met and people are then in, involved. If that student, if the attendance clerk doesn't ask anything, it's like, okay, well, good, good to see you, head on to class. They go to second period. Well, you know, Johnny, where you been? Well, I, I was at the doctor, da, 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 and they say, I got a concussion last night. Well, the second period teacher, there's two people they need to call that are notified, the nurse and the principal designee. If a parent calls, let's say it's a middle school student, and the student maybe they're not just they're not comfortable talking to adults yet, and they, they're kind of like oh, I don't want any, I don't know what to say or don't know what to do. So if the parent calls their counselor, which they usually are familiar with because the counselors loop with the kids, and they say, you know what, Miss Johnson, I just want to let you know, Johnny was sustained this injury and we, he's got a concussion. The counselor knows to notify two people. So regardless of the, who, is no, who, who was made aware, things can be put in place in a pretty efficient manner, and then those things will take place just like the student with the, the, the visible injury, those things can take place as well. 
Um, did, this, did the student bring anything from the doctor? What are their restrictions? What kind of accommodations they need? What's their schedule look like? Are, uh, what, what type of breaks do they need during the day? The parents can get involved, but once again, it kind of folds right into that commit process, but it is this more of a streamline, um, regardless of, it, it's not an athletic thing, it is a school thing. Now, once again, the athletic group might be the ones who notify up in the, up in the building, but it's, it is definitely a much more streamlined process. And we've had communication with all the groups that will touch base. Um, you know, the principals have shared that with their staff members. They shared with me who their principal designee is, and we have a list. We've had some conversation um, with the nurses, with the coaches, the athletic directors. So all the kind of the key players are involved, and and not that that's foolproof for anything, but we do hope it will strengthen that uh, kind of that safety net for those kids that go through there. Carrie I'm, Carrie, I'm really, really happy yeah. to see this amount of engagement and this yeah. amount of work because we just from our own fellow board member last year with Carolyn's daughter, it's amazing how these can linger. And hers was a drama accident. Mm -hmm. Who thinks this happens in drama? So thank you very much. I'll also put my two cents in for the $2. That's something as a district we should pay for. I don't want any child hesitant <coughs> to do this because $2. At, for at, the baseline. For the baseline. Yeah. At, at, at maximum, they would cost us $50,000, assuming half of our kids are in athletics. So right. strongly support us paying for that. Right. And it's specifically, thank you for that segue <laughs> into, uh, into the topic, but from a baseline standpoint, we have, uh, we have had the testing that has taken place for the last four or five years, but once again, the participation has been pretty minimal compared to the number of kids that we have participated in, in athletics and also our, our cheer squads. So what we are hoping to do, now that we have conducted a, a formal RFP and, and thrown it out there this summer, and then brought a recommendation to you at, uh, that you approved in, in the board meeting in September, but we do hope that we can increase the numbers and do that in a couple of ways. And I have had a number of conversations with um, Brian McCord and Megan Schuler as they, as they guide the SHAC committee and, and follow some um, guidance that you have provided for them in, in this last year or so, specifically about concussions. One of them is paying uh, for it. It is, it's, it's $2 a piece. It's not gonna, it's not gonna break the bank. Uh, Steve will be gone, so we'll spend it anyway <laughs> by them. But uh, we, we can do that. And the other thing, if we do that, we, we also, if we can capture those kids while they're on campus and go ahead and just do it while they're in the athletic periods, and that, you know, in, our, in the different computer labs, it's not gonna, we can work that out, all the logistics with the principals and the campuses. But if we can facilitate that, that, that will capture pretty much everybody. It, it will not be an expensive um, process. And the other thing that we can look at is, you know, whether we do that annually or do that every other year, uh, kind of the standard is that test if every other year is appropriate, there, that is not necessary to do it each year, although we can, once again, back to the $2. But I think it will also help, uh, you know, in the communication and the awareness and then the, the benefits that can, can uh, come Come from it later. You'll be hearing, uh, hopefully, those recommendations that I have shared with them as they make their presentation to the board, the SHAC committee, and in the October meeting. So, hopefully, some of these things that you're hearing tonight will be echoed during their presentation, um, which will once again reinforce that this has a, been a pretty big conversation over the last few months with, with several people. Carrie, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's great news. Thank you. you bet. So buses are all good. Mm -hmm. Especially a certain one. Yeah. <laughs> no, they are all good. We, we work at it daily. The uh, entire department out there does a great job. Okay, our next uh, cabinet member is another new cabinet member. And she's with Employee Services, Dr. Brockman. Thank you. And I would like to start off by um, expressing a huge uh, debt of gratitude to um, my folks <laughs> as I walked in uh, really in the middle of this. This had, this had really begun already when I arrived in the district and uh, the teams in my department have done an amazing job of not only getting me up to speed but allowing me to be uh, an integral part of this process even though I did not have all of the context moving in so uh, they're wonderful people 
great professionals. So I'm just going to highlight a few things in uh, the two goals that are represented with employee services. The first is with student learning and the Professional Learning Commission work continues and then we're adding the Professional Learning Executive Committee to that as we really look at uh, the culture of professional learning in the district. Um, intentionally designed opportunities for non-instructional staff and this is something that my colleague was referring to as well whether it's uh, those who serve in the transportation department those who serve in fans or other non-instructional uh, positions intentionally designed opportunities for them to continue to grow uh, goals around uh, reflective goal setting for teachers and campus administrators as well as moving into the realm of non-instructional staff. Of course, it's, it's uh, intuitive almost for teachers and campus administrators because that reflective goal setting is part of their annual evaluation process. It uh, will be new learning for some of our non-instructional staff. But we continue to support those um, teachers, campus administrators, in the reflective goal setting related to evaluation as we continue to support uh, with resources and coaching and time uh, those new evaluation systems that they are uh, engaged with. Continue to collaborate with a multitude of people around the district, everyone at this table. Um, certainly nothing in the goals here are standalone for employee services. Um, but the collaboration continues in creating intentional pathways for employee growth and capacity building. Whether it's a uh, transition from a paraprofessional position to a professional position or professional moving to the next stage in their career, those designs of intentional pathways. We continue our commitment to equity through cultural proficiency learning and engagement with those, um, those initiatives and, the, and those topics that are so important in any district, but especially a district as diverse as Plano ISD, but also in the review, revision, and in some cases expansion of current staffing guidelines to make sure that we are providing equitable staff experience as well as uh, staff amounts at, at our campuses as they face a variety of needs. When you look on the next page on efficient use of resources, we have three goals uh, that also represent extensive collaboration between departments. Um, looking at the hiring processes and, and standardizing hiring processes and guidelines across the district and across the organization. Not just in one area or another, but really supporting our hiring administrators in utilizing of best practices by providing some, some guidelines and, and supports in process there. Um, absence management. This is an area that um, there's a need to be a little tighter and be a little more consistent in what we do across the district. It is also an area when you're looking at the types of absences and uh, employment law, et cetera, where there's new learning to be had every single year and, and needing to provide some resources for our campus and department leaders in managing uh, those types of, of items with their, with their employees that they, that they work with and lead with. And then the teacher extended planning is about ready to launch um, this is, has really been a result of a lot of extensive collaborative work from a number of people. It is, it is the one item on, on these goals that uh, is ready to go. Well, tomorrow, ready to go. So pretty excited about that and that opportunity for teachers, but also the, the data we'll be collecting along the way, the feedback we'll be collecting along the way to evaluate uh, the value of that and that dedication of resources. So, happy to answer any questions that you have. Beth, on the staffing equity um, item, is that having to do with like the staffing ratios that we apply during the budgeting process and <coughs> reevaluating the departmental needs that way? Is that what we're talking about? 
yes, staffing from A to Z, if you will, uh, really reviewing the, the entire process from timelines to uh, routing of requests to uh, determining needs to providing cushion where cushion may be needed. And okay. And, and maybe if there's a specific standard that we want to have in a certain area, making sure that that standard is staffed in our allocation processes so that it gets applied, if that's what is needed. Okay. Absolutely. That's great. You're looking at all of that. Will you be doing that in partnership with the Assessment, Research, and Program Evaluation Department? They seem to have a commonality there. This will be done in partnership with everybody. <laughs> Uh, this is not something that, that can be undertaken alone. So uh, when you're looking at, at staffing, and I'll just use campus staffing as an example, uh, every department touches a, a campus and the staffing needs on that campus, whether it be for a particular program, um, uh, whether it's a, a campus with higher poverty rates or a, a campus that needs a different kind of ratio for staff, um, whether it's those staffing to meet the needs of English language learners or special education students, um, staffing of front office, staffing of uh, paraprofessionals. Um, so it touches everyone, especially when campuses have out of the box needs, out of the standard formula needs, which is where we would be intersecting, intersecting quite a bit with the group you mentioned, <coughs> as campuses are identifying needs. We need to be prepared to have the room uh, in the staffing to, to meet those needs. Just a shout out to HR and to culture, actually, D Dr. Solomon. You know, June gave me data recently. Uh, we our, our teacher turnover rate uh, went down to 10.7%. Uh, and that's about culture and then but we got also got really better at hiring faster and uh, so I'm but the reality is if if that teacher turnover rate was what the state average is we would have had to hire about 250 more teachers and that's going to affect the the quality that you get the quality of support you can give them as they enter the district so uh, just really kudos to to everybody to make make that uh, we had people in place when our kids showed up and that's never taken for granted thank absolutely you. it's a great team and thank you for acknowledging them um, in this forum it <coughs> costs a lot to hire a new person and we don't think about those costs because we don't necessarily put a price tag on each new person that walks in the door. But you think just of the investment of time and capacity building um, that, that is involved in getting that new person up to speed, and it's typically not a one-year event. Mm -hmm. And um, higher quality and keep quality. So, Dr. Bingley, you beat me to that point. Uh, I was going to make the same comment to you as I did to Susan, culture, culture of creativity, and not only in schools, of course, in the campuses, but also in this building. Uh, we're about to embark on the strategic planning process, but there is a statement that I always uh, keep in mind, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It uh, doesn't matter how good our strategic planning is if we don't have the culture that would support it. And, uh, you know, when we talk about bringing teachers into the district and uh, we want to be in the top quartile, top 25th percentile of um, salaries, uh, I think the difference between the top and the bottom is like a thousand dollars which is two percent of uh, the average salary. That's not what brings people to our district and that's not what would keep them a culture that they enjoy, a culture that gives them the autonomy, that reduces bureaucracy, that, that makes, them, makes them creative. Uh, is what will make or break it. So uh, for both of you, I think that's, that's critical. I agree. Dr. Brockman, I have just, can I ask you to elaborate a little bit more about the extended planning that we're affording to our teachers, how we're rolling that out? I'm gonna pass that okay. along to one of my colleagues to the right who's been more engaged with that that's from fine. the beginning. 
didn't mean to put Thank you on Thank you the hot for the seat. grace. No, I appreciate that. And I'm going to be watching right over my shoulder at Suzanne Dropman, so <laughs> be ready to sprint to Where the microphone, she? Suzanne. Um, we, we have very collaboratively, I think every department has been involved in this, um, created um, additional subcodes for campuses depending on the number of teachers that they have and then um, have developed some guidelines for expected use and it, as an average this would allow um, approximately each team of teachers to have either a full day or, a, or two half days during the semester to plan. Um, and we're really going tomorrow to talk to principals about there's not an expectation that this needs to be applied uh, unilaterally across all teams. We really want them to look at where the needs are. Um, you know, perhaps there are new team members um, that need additional time together or, you know, at the secondary level we have some teachers who are the lone teacher on the campus and so providing time across the district for, for example, our computer science teachers, it's a new course to be able to plan together. Um, does that give enough? Yeah, that helps, that helps. And so like the journalism, that's another one that comes to mind. Right, so it'll, it'll really be um, as the principal works with the leadership team and identifying where are the needs. There, there is not, um, there are not enough subcodes for 100% of the teachers to um, have the opportunity to do that during the, the year, partly because we really want to look at what our capacity is with substitutes as well. Suzanne has spent a great deal of time um, looking at that because it, we want to be sure in providing this that we're not leaving other classrooms without a substitute. So. Um, I think that this is a really good first step for us. Um, we'll be collecting, as Beth said, some um, feedback from teachers along the way so that we have uh, a report to share with you um, at the end of the year on effectiveness and possible next steps. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, Mr. Armstrong with technology, please. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bender. Um, Wow, it's just last month, I think, we launched the tech plan. Uh, so you'll see that a lot of the goals in here line up uh, amazingly well with the tech plan. Um, now, the tech plan was a four-year duration. Uh, we did split out a lot of this first year into those goal sets uh, for this first year. So you almost have to look at these goals kind of linearly uh, because as we've been going through we've gone through a big infrastructure upgrade over the summer that's the routing project it's actually taking place right now uh, we'll be finishing it here in october um, but we've also been working on upgrading our um, desktops to windows 10 office 26 and all the ramifications that come with a major upgrade like that are taking us into this fall, but we're now starting to turn this whole ship uh, to a newer paradigm with the Chromebook. So we've talked about the One to Web project. Uh, that on the back end is coming up as we start procuring the equipment, and we're getting ready to start staging and rolling that equipment out. We're going to start with the teachers first, and then we're going to work into the student devices and those allotments. We've already started with a lot of those title schools. Uh, we're, we're ramping up right now. Matt's group is doing a great job uh, building up all the professional learning uh, that needs to take place so we don't just, you know, drop them out there and say, here you go and walk away. Uh, one of the big projects that we're talking about is still the web desk platform and as we integrate all the textbooks um, and work with curriculum as we move forward, we'll be doing a lot of transitioning uh, you heard a little bit from what Katrina had noted also with the curriculum planner as that starts to change and go on that platform we're building that that student interface uh, so the lesson plans have a delivery mechanism that can be utilized by this new structure uh, that we're going to be rolling out so 
lot of that's taking place. Uh, I think that's going to be a, a, an action item, a board action item that's going to come up later on in the spring. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that project as it, as it progresses. Uh, one of the things you probably, if you read it from the plan, it really didn't start until next year where we're going to start doing the uh, audio visual, the projectors and stuff in a lot of the sites because they're based on older styles of technology. I was talking with Matt and um, we really need to start that project a little bit into this year uh, because of certain needs. So that's why you see that at the title schools, we're going to hurry up and go into those sites first and start upgrading to the higher, um, to the newer standards uh, for audio also. Uh, we're having some issues uh, with the speaker sets and everything too. So the teacher's voice can be projected out uh, better to the classroom. So um, we'll be working on that project also throughout this year to standardize on a lot of uh, what works best uh, with the delivery of the curriculum into these classrooms. Um, some of the other projects uh, Carla noted uh, that we're working together on the website project, uh, that's moving forward. I want to say that Wilson came online today. I'm really excited. Last week, I think Vines and Pearson. It's a, we talk about it like it's already done, but it's not. We got to do these aside at a time and we're working with the staff. Remember, there's those ADA compliance things we're trying to also integrate in as we go along, but build that consistency for the whole platform, for uh, the district also with the campuses, and, and it's all coming together now. Um, it is a big project and it's gonna take a good part of this year to still uh, roll this, this project out. Um, but that's coming along. Uh, I also want to let you know about the video surveillance systems. Uh, that project, we took a big chunk out of it this summer uh, but that's rolling along also where we're trying to, we have over 5,000 video surveillance cameras. Uh, a lot of them are over 10 to 15 years old. We're working with the campuses that have the older ones. What we can do to keep their systems going, but we're collapsing on a more of a vendor agnostic solution uh, that we're also working with the city on uh, so that we can provide what Joe is talking about is you know, a uh, campus can pull up their map and then see the little cameras on there on where they, you just hover over it and click and you can see the cameras um, in a web interface or in, or in a portable interface. Um, a lot of that's being tested right now. Uh, we're looking to get about a third of those done throughout this year, but um, over the next couple, over the next year, we're hoping to get all the sites completed on next year's plan. So you may hear me talk about this a little bit more next year. Um, but those are the, a lot of the larger projects that we're talking about. Uh, when we talked about the integration of the curriculum and the, um, getting everything out to the web desk, one of the other components is a board action item also we'll be coming back on is security. Uh, as we do more and more information uh, dissemination to cloud and all of these components, uh, a real big cybersecurity component. Uh, it is a big factor of that and we'll be talking a lot more about that in a, I believe the November uh, work session, but that kind of goes hand in hand um, as one of the other action items that's going to be coming about uh, in the future. So um, the last piece that I did want to go over, now Norm you said earlier that you could pull this one off the agenda, um, but I think I'm going to have to put it back on and that is this room uh, and Sockwell. Um, but we, we do have struggles in this room, audio visual wise in the presentation. We don't stream it online. That's one of our uh, issues that, that does come up as an inhibiting factor, but there's a lot of issues with this room um, that have just been kind of taped together on the back end, but really does need to be addressed. Um, so this year, um, working right now with the group, with Carla's group actually, um, and, and some of the other uh, groups, Tony and John, uh, talking about how we're actually gonna, where we're assessing, the, doing the needs assessment of everything that we really need in this room. 
Um, I'm not going to go over all the issues. You guys already know the issues with certain things with microphones and the camera shaking and the, um, there, there's a lot of things that do need to be addressed uh, in this in this room, but we'll be uh, talking about addressing it. Also, the ADA compliance component. This was mentioned uh, with with uh, subtitles and everything that needs to be done in the video streams. Um, that does need to be addressed. So uh, this year we'll be also uh, pulling groups together to address uh, this one and Sopwell um, as one of the larger ticket items for audiovisual needs. So th those are a lot of the big goals. I don't know if you have any questions. Just let me know. Just a quick clarification. When you talked about that uh, camera system where you can click and hover and see different activities on different cameras, are you saying that the police department will be able to plug into that as well and see the campus? We're working with them now. I'll say that to a caveat. Okay. There's a small caveat to it because when we did this Senate Bill 507 and the, those cameras are exempted out because there's very special right. type of camera. Right. But yes, we are working with them so that um, they have a need for their first responders sometimes to come up. Mm -hmm. And, and um, right now, it's they do have certain views mm -hmm. from the police dispatch okay. area to, to our network uh, but the whole goal is to be mobile with it so the squad cars can but we're, we're not that far yet I see. okay thank you okay thank you Dan great and our last report comes from Dr. Dash assessment research and program evaluation And that's enough for the day. <laughs> so uh, the first uh, task that I will go over is the campus improvement planning process. And first I have to acknowledge that this was a, this was a kind of a big review and it was a collaborative effort and we worked closely with campus services, uh, Mark's group on social emotional learning guidance, uh, secondary and elementary curriculum, special ed, multilingual, so because they all have key roles to play. In fact, they have kind of more important roles than my department in this process. So when we initially, what we did was we kind of went back and looked exactly what our process is. What is our process? What's our, what's our, what are best practices in campus improvement planning? What's our, what's our need and what's our capacity? Because you know we can't overpromise. We just had to we had to start and kind of move on. The what we looked at was if we are to do it all over again, kind of, kind of start from the beginning. What it would really look like and how would you design it? We kind of had all the parts in place, but we looked at how we communicated them, what what is optional, what is mandatory. Uh, what's the timeline that our activities, you know. So the goal was we really wanted very open, very sequential in some sense, so that the campus team can take the process and kind of follow it and do the, do the and arrive at a comprehensive campus improvement plan. So the first task was we, we, we want to do a tiered process. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to kind of talk around all five boxes really because we, we had a defined campus improvement process for a long time. We introduced uh, a professional P3A uh, in about four or five years ago. So some of the parts were in place. So what the goal was how to kind of fit these things very fluidly into the system so that they can follow it. So. Capacity was another issue. We cannot promise a resource for every campus, and especially in, at secondary level, for every department, uh, every grade level, honors versus regular, because there are so many different variables that can go into effect. So the, the initial model, this is, uh, is to divide the campuses into four groups based on need, and it's not, set in concrete at the beginning of the year. 
if we see that there are some campuses that needs to needs more services and campus that needs to be less services, we can adjust because we want to be flexible as we move along the year. And it will also depend on some of our interim progress measures. If some campuses may receive more progress, more support, let's say after some mid-year review of what the outcomes are going to be. So the, the key parts are the timeline where, where we start. So we, we, in fact, we learned quite a bit working with extensively with eight schools right now that we uh, are having to work with. Uh, we are, we, let us almost maybe, except Matt, everybody here uh, most probably have been at campuses extensively the last, last two, two and a half weeks. Uh, at working at different levels. We went through uh, uh, what's called comprehensive needs analysis. We create problem statements. Now this week we are looking at root causes with, with our, uh, the most high need campuses. And then by in about two weeks, in fact by October 5th, we would have developed comp uh, campus improvement plans. And if you are working with schools, facilitating that almost one-on-one -on -one with with multiple team members from here, from, from assessment, from curriculum, campus services. And it's also a learning process for us because what we're gonna do is we're gonna model that for our other tiers that need the service. So for example, uh, uh, some campuses based on need and levels of performance will get bi-weekly visits. Uh, we will help them plan, we will help them with their monthly planning meetings, we will help uh, with their vertical team meetings, and, and that level of support will differentiate based on those four groups. Uh, we know, exa and we are also building in uh, short term, medium term, and long term checkpoints in the system, so that we know Everybody knows before when the campus improvement plan is designed, the short term need is we are gonna, how we are, how we are putting things in place. Uh, the mid-year term will be uh, an outcome that is measurable and the long term will be uh, at the end of the year or close to end of the year how, what the outcome performance is. Uh, you know, in addition to these, there are other parts that will come in during the summer. We're going to leverage uh, some time uh, after school ends until the administrators leave, uh, middle of June. We're going to leverage some time when the administrators come back, uh, the last week of July, until the beginning of school year. A and the, what I mean by leverage is we have to increase the capacity at the campuses to do this. Uh, so there's training built in for the principals. There's training built in uh, for assistant principals and as needed or even other nominated staff at the campuses to kind of create a culture of campus improvement planning. When I mean, when I mean by that is the whole cycle of it so that, it's, so that they can distribute the effort at a, at especially at a large campus. Uh, second, at, this most probably can be led at the elementary level by the principals and the APs, but how would you handle a middle school or even a high school? I'm still not sure how we're gonna handle senior high schools, uh, but, you know, but we're gonna try. But the idea is to, if you increase capacity, including like department chairs at these schools, to lead the effort in campus improvement planning because, so that we can get, implement, kind of complete the whole cycle. Uh, I will pause right now before I go to the other two if you have any questions. I, I just want to know what the four tiers or whatever we're calling them, what, where do you draw that line to differentiate? I understand Title I, okay. but the one that's non-Title I. It is, honestly, it, it was not, not very, very sophisticated. Okay. But, so, yeah, so it kept it simple, okay. uh, uh, and we divided the two groups, campuses into two groups, the Title I campuses and the non-Title I campuses. Right. Because there are certain requirements 
that comes with Title I funding, mandatory requirements that we simply have to do. Right. So I guess more specifically, the target. Ta yeah. No, no, all Title I campuses. Right, but I'm asking about this. So then we broke the Title I campuses into two groups. And for this school here, the, the ones that we have to mandatorily do required campus improvement plans to a, and follow the state system, those eight schools we are going to start this year. And then the remaining, out of the 25 Title I schools, the remaining 17 is the next year. And then the group that is non-Title I, we, in fact, I, I, I kind of looked at the uh, proportion of economically disadvantaged and their performance level, and uh, not a very scientific way of doing it, but determined that about tw around 20% economically disadvantaged on the non-Title I campuses their needs most probably is, is a little bit higher, in fact, more probably significantly higher than campuses below 20%. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean, for example, Williams, for example, is 50% economically disadvantaged, and they're not Title I by definition. We most probably will get, give more support to Williams, though technically they are not Title I. So there are, we might kind of individually play schools Another one that plays is the bilingual, a proportion of ELL students and out of those proportion that are bilingual. That plays a large role in, a, in, in so we might kind of hand pick and kind of move some campuses around based on need. All right, thank you. But it's, it's fluid based on what we observe when the curriculum teams visit. If we see that one campus needs to kind of move up to the next threshold, we will do that. Nash, I'm really thrilled to see this work and in a systematic manner. I, I will offer, often, excuse me, offer one caution. We just can't look at percentages. We actually had a system like that around here four or five years ago and it completely under-resourced some schools where their percentage of low socioeconomic wasn't as high, but the absolute number of children they had in need was high because of their school size. I use as an example or Sigler, which is 70% free and reduced lunch. So everyone's attention goes there. They have the uh, Toyota Family Literacy Program. They actually have the percentage would be 280 children in need. You look at Mitchell and say, oh, they only have 38% low socioeconomic, but they're a big campus. They actually have 296 children in financial need, so actually more than Sigler. So it's incumbent upon us not just to look at the percentage, but the total number of children in need at these campuses so we don't recreate an error that we had four or five years ago. And so I think we need to be very, look with great discernment at these campuses and not, we just can't use the percentages because if you're a big campus, you could still have a lot of kids and a lot of teachers who could use our extra help. Um, the other, other point I'd just like to make to my fellow board members is you know, we're really proud of some of our numbers in Plano, like the 124 National Merit Scholars. So proud of all those kids. But these eight campuses in Group 4, that represents 3,993 children, little children, who are attending schools that the federal and the state government think are not doing all that they should do. So I hope as we make all of our decisions, we think about that almost 4,000 kids in Plano schools that we really can't be that proud of. Not that we're not proud of the kids, we can't be proud of the product that we're putting forth there. That's a lot of kids that we need to help. We intentionally built in, uh, in fact, checkpoints in the system where we can look at and then have conversations with the principals and uh, talk and kind of have a process in place to request additional resources in the middle of the cycle. So, uh, so we, you know, again, and also additional staff that we assign, you know, in case of specialists, counselors, we are, we are also looking into like, I was gonna say, the, uh, kind of looking into the role they can play in the campus improvement cycle more as on-site guides and, and, and do the self-checks and do the monitoring so that because we can't be there uh, every day or, or, or eight hours a day at these schools. That pushing is really important because I think historically we've had a culture in Plano where the principals didn't ask for help. It was perceived as a weakness that they couldn't do it all themselves. And so I hope that your team will continue to observe, conjole, and it maybe at times demand that they accept help. 
other questions? I, I'm so glad to see the plan. We've been asking for the plan, knowing that there was a lot of work that was happening behind the scenes that we just couldn't see. And, and now you, the detail that you've shared, you know, we've been able to see the plan. So I'm, I, I know I'll speak, try to speak for all of us. We're so glad to see the accountability, the ownership, and the authority, and you having the access to the resources that can help all of our campuses uh, grow and and uh, provide the, the resources so that we can equitably um, do all we can to help each child be as successful as possible. So this is great. Dash, when will we see an update on the targeted eight campuses? The board see an update? Well, uh, you're going to see the very uh, the first one will come to the board uh, at the next board meeting for Meadows because we are required to send the, get the board approval for the plan. Uh, by so most probably, maybe we can maybe talk about exactly. Yeah, we're working on the board communication plan, and, and we've almost got the annual plan set up where it's what's going in the board update each month, what's going in executive sessions, what's going on work session agendas, and and in board meeting reports. And so we have a draft and we're finalizing the draft next week in cabinet. So it, it should be within two weeks, you'll have a plan that'll show you where the updates are coming. Right. So that it's in chunks mm -hmm. instead of waiting till the end. Right. Okay. And I'll add one comment. Uh, you have an item uh, under efficient use of resources, you have uh, campus environmental surveys. And I presume that uh, uh, under climate you have culture and having, having the ability to set a baseline and know where we are now and know how all the work that will be done to change culture, to improve culture, is going to be something that's measurable and we can see progress. In fact, w one thing that we realized is uh, working with the most neediest campuses is we, we really need to get a baseline on improving, on measuring what the culture is and see how that baseline moves annually. So we are looking into some pretty nationally recognized school culture instruments uh, to implement at some of these schools. I, I would encourage you to go even beyond school instruments into other industry instruments and uh, see what you can borrow. I know that there's one that I, I use a lot uh, called KEYS, K-E-Y-S. It's coming from the Center for Creative Leadership. I, I have no affiliation to that. Uh, but, um, and, and there are others that measure culture, measure the, the climate in, in general in organizations. So you may want to kind of go outside just the school area. Well, uh, to cover those two uh, efficient use of resources at the bottom, so the idea is first we're going to study every little, medium, large survey we do. In fact, we, in fact, I don't think any one of us know all the surveys that we've done. So, so the first task is kind of get a review of what, because we have surveys from like community and student engagement, with strategic plan, uh, uh, outcome indicators, part of the initiatives has surveys, then we have internal audit surveys. Uh, teacher surveys, uh, some surveys required by the state. So uh, it's, it's, it'll be a learning curve and kind of see how we can efficiently deliver the service. Uh, the action plan is we are studying it. Uh, but some are mandatory, uh, which, which we'll have to give. Uh, so the idea is, is to minimize the number of surveys and maybe combine them and maybe also to communicate it uh, well so that the idea of surveys is we know we have 67 or 71 schools. Each one may start at a different point in, in their culture, in their responses. So it's very hard to compare survey results from one school to the other. How you compare survey results is from within the school from one year to the, the next and how that culture moves. So that's very important to have kind of a relative measure of, on the surveys. The, the other action item on the on the dashboards, uh, 
from my prior experiences, I, I tell this to uh, uh, Sarah all the time, you know, we better draw a really strong box on what, what we want to measure. Because, you know, you can start with five, you can end up with 500, mm -hmm. you know, very soon, and you kind of lose focus on everything. So it is very important in, in process improvement to measure what is, you prioritize all of them and measure the ones that truly have the, maybe Dr. Solomon knows this, measure that 20% that will give you the 80% outcome, right? So, so we, we're gonna study that process and see what metrics are, are the most important for us and what we value. And the next step in the process is what tools we have to share that, whether we already have tools in place. Uh, uh, and by November, most probably we should be in a good position to give some feedback on it. It's just that when we look at the output, uh, the outcome indicators, uh, the performance of our schools, performance of our students, graduation rates and everything, uh, those are trailing indicators. Uh, if you can measure the climate that leads there, that's your leading indicator. If that would tell you what the outcome is going to be a few years from now. Okay, thank you, Dash. Great. And I've, I'll just mention a comment, and then you guys may want to make some comments. So this, this activity that we've just experienced is the first time that we've undertaken this, this kind of planning effort and to this level of detail. And I, I know that it's been a tremendous uh, use of your time and devotion to this activity, but um, from this board member, I really appreciate all the investment that you made and the thinking that it took and the talking to one another, uh, not just in your department, but across departments to figure out what should we be doing and putting those plans in place now to help us and help you track whether we're accomplishing them over the course of the year so we're not looking back wishing that we had done something differently sooner. So um, I know this was hard, but uh, Thank you for bringing this process to us, and thank you for doing it. Um, that's just from me, but I, I, I bet all of you share that same appreciation. <laughs> yeah, I think this was uh, very succinct, very uh, comprehensive, uh, very consistent across all the different departments. It was great. Well, well done. I think I agree with Yoram too. I thought it was very comprehensive and. To tell you the truth, I think throughout and listened to every every uh, action goals that you had, and I think that you know to to find out that these goals are going to be accomplished this school year is going to be impressive. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to chime in. Um, first of all, I appreciate the board's input. I mean, it, it's a team effort, and, and we're all in this together. <laughs> and so uh, to try to do great things for kids and, and schools, but um, to the team. Uh, I know it's been a relentless process to, to put all this together and not just to set a goal, but then to ask you to drill so deeply with your teams into all the details is asking a lot because those things would be happening whether we wrote it down or not. Right. Um, so thank you for all of the time and for everyone sitting out there who, who came tonight. A lot of our writers of the plan uh, are sitting in the chairs behind and they have stayed until 9.30 in case we had a question that they needed to come up and answer because they own the work. For every line in that plan, there's probably 10 people working on a line uh, and a plan behind that. And so um, this is, it's not simple work. It's really complex work. And they have worked together. We have beat this to death. And so um, thanks so much to the team and to, to everyone here who's contributed to the process because uh, it's a, it does take a whole bunch of people to, to get the work done. And so I appreciate it. Y'all have been so gracious and hardworking. So thanks. No doubt. Y'all did a great job. And, and Sarah, as, as the ringleader, fantastic work. Thank you so much on behalf of our teachers and our kids.
And Missy said I had to color code it. I right. said, what? That was the final thing. <laughs> that was the final thing. Oh, I was no. like, all right, we can color code. It was a great, a great suggestion. It helped me. I don't know if it helped no, you. I, it I actually like that. But it helped yeah. me it make the really great suggestion. relationships more clear. Yep. Right. Um, our last item, upcoming meeting agendas. Uh, two agendas I want to get your input on. First one I'll ask Brian to kick off, which has to do with uh, I'd like to seek your input on agenda items for the joint meeting that we're going to have with the city in about a month. So he's got a starting point, and we'd like to get your feedback. Yeah, uh, real quickly, we actually already have we have seven items that have emerged either from interest of board members in sharing with the city, or in a couple cases, the city interested in hearing from us. And so this is what we have at this point. I uh, just want to make sure that it is good with everybody. Uh, if we have to pair one or two away, I will tell you. But hopefully, I'm, I've talked to Bruce Glasscock a couple times. I'll call him back tomorrow after we have this conversation. Here are the items. Uh, our strategic planning process coming forward. Our state of the schools event coming forward. Uh, they wanted an update on our update on our pre-K, so we can do that. An update on our Fine Arts Center, and I think they have some things that they want to share that will be in collaboration. Our Adult Transition Center, we want to make sure they're aware of that. Our Future Industries Academy, where that is, and, and our collaboration potentially with Collin College. And uh, an enrollment update, and that's something they wanted to hear as well. So those would be the seven. Um, we could probably do them relatively quickly, each one, but uh, Ms. Benner and I talked about we might have to adjust the time commitment uh, for each. We're looking at like 45 minutes total for each entity to share. So that would mean like five minutes or so for each one of these. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I wanted to know if you're okay with these. It's a lot. I'm okay. <laughs> After this setup, I hate to add one more thing, but I would like to hear uh, what Dan was talking about, some kind of collaboration with the uh, police department uh, in, in security, especially given uh, newer technology that's, that's being implemented there. And, and you know, uh, to, to be honest, it doesn't have to be even within the meeting, even if we can get some right. kind of a report outside of that I meeting. I was going to say, we have, you know, the three yeah. board members that are liaisons to yes. their organization, and they, I think, have two. So if in the feedback with the gla uh, Bruce, mm -hmm. he says, yeah. uh, it's too much, maybe we could offload some of that work yep. for exploration yeah. with that smaller That's committee fine. and have uh, some learning mm -hmm. to come out of that. So I heard a lot of things that they want to hear from us. Is there anything we want to hear from them? Have we had that conversation? We have. Uh, well, Brian has. Yeah. Uh, I've had, well, even just the other day, we talked about, you know, can the city own some of this issue around enrollment? And as, as Missy talked about, you know, are there, are there incentives that can get seniors out of some of the homes that might be affordable? <laughs> And, and that can be a, a, a 55 plus or something that, that allows them to not leave the community they love, but leave this house that they don't need two of the bedrooms. And we could use a first and a third grader in there. Um, and are there more affordable options? And, and, you know, this first is this understanding that you may think you're bringing in businesses and everything else, but our enrollment is what it is because of the realities of our housing and and so, yeah, we, those, that's an issue that we, we talked about that we, we'd like to hear from them. We actually talked about it last, last yeah. year. No. We didn't get <laughs> anywhere. But we can um, I think I, I guess it would be nice to hear from the city what, what plans they have for uh, ongoing neighborhood improvements. Mm -hmm. And I always talk to Harry about um, 17th Street. It's a patchwork quilt. <laughs> they got 18th Street fixed, but 17th is kind of chunky. Okay, so that and code enforcement. Yeah. On 17th Street? Just, just in, in general. general. I mean, <laughs> when you see dogs, stray dogs, and you see cars parked in driveways that are from an era before I was born, 
that. <laughs> I'm just saying, those kind of things. Okay, so housing options, and then the next three are kind of related. Plans for ongoing neighborhood improvement, code enforcement, and specifically on, do they have plans for 17th yeah. Street? I, I think that all kind of fits in one little package. Well, if we bring up 17, then how about Ohio? Missy, something I'd like to make sure we communicate to them is just the percentage of low socioeconomic kids. That would come in under part of enrollment. Mm -hmm. I think Harry is now sensitized to, to the diversity of our community and the work that he's done with you know, the backpacks for children and so forth. But I don't know if all of the new council mm -hmm. people are as well versed in that. So I think it's important for them to understand the diversity of the economic situations we face. Okay. Yeah, and, and it's not only economic. I mean, you know, while our enrollment is kind of doing this, we just had a conversation today. Our ELL enrollment is doing this, and uh, so there, there are there are some things embedded within that enrollment data that they may or may not know. Okay, so we'll throw those ideas back to them, and uh, if if we don't have time, then we'll offload some work. Well, included with what her point was, yeah, I got the, it. The increase In, of ELL yes. and special ed. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, um, agenda-wise, in your materials, you see what's coming up. Um, any comments? W one thing that I would like to ask is that uh, we allocate uh, maybe five minutes in a meeting, kind of on a standing basis, to go over the uh, action item list and just see if there is any update. And specifically, not not to discuss, not update on the specific items. Not check to the status. Check the status. Is no. uh, is there anything that's? Uh, I know you're doing that in the cabinet meetings. Mm -hmm. um, that yeah. it takes place there, and then it gets folded into our planning meetings when mm -hmm. I, we're working on the agenda. Um, so those should actually be appearing on here, right, Denise? Yes. So okay. if there is an outstanding thing. Uh, you figure out where it's going to be complete, who owns it, and when it's going to be done, and then it shows up on here. Okay, because I, I looked at some items and uh, I didn't see uh, where that was going. I, I didn't see a, a progress on this is when it's going to be uh, presented to the board. Yeah, we we were trying to get the plan of work done because some of the action tracker items fold into the plans. Right. And so then we'll go mm -hmm. back and especially like the GPA class rank items yep. um, that that fold into this. And so we'll we'll start to link those up as well and look at where they connect back into reporting. Mm -hmm. And and there was one item that when I looked at the list, the one item that was missing there, uh, I know that I brought it up three times, I think, in, in three board meetings, and it seemed like we wanted to just investigate and know, and that's the year-round school. The, uh, what, what does it mean to have a year-round school here? So when you say investigate it, what are you asking for? You're asking for a report? Yeah. Is that what you're asking for? Yeah. So. Kind of not, not spend too much time on it, just uh, kind of initial thoughts. What, what does it mean? What, what does it mean financially? What does it mean from teacher's perspective? So let, since we've just heard about all of the work that they're doing, I'd like yeah. to test that idea with the board to see if, if it's something that you want staff to spend time on. So is there, can I get some feedback on that? So, so in this case, uh, then, then let me make the case for it. Uh, and this is something that came from, uh, I, I believe it was NSBA, the, the last uh, NSBA meeting. It was a conference that, uh, that I attended and uh, I don't remember which district or even what state that was in, but they tried, and, and they they were they started from research that showed that uh, students really lose a lot during the summer months, and especially students from low socioeconomic uh, status. And if they start school at kindergarten six months behind, they finish fifth grade two and a half to three years behind. And where they lose the, their, the, where they make the biggest losses is during the summer months. And so what they did was they started with two schools. They were two years into the project, into the project and um, they see a lot of improvement in catching up with those students. Uh, so, you know, I can dig up my notes from NSBA and uh, 
find that specific session and maybe find who was uh, presenting it and so on so uh, we can take a look at it but uh, you know if we can prevent uh, the students that are struggling from falling further behind because it's just the summertime the, the last time I think we, I brought it up we talked about uh, whether this is something we can or cannot get uh, state funding for because it's students sitting in, in chairs what are the implications from transportation air conditioning things like that the one thing we did clarify that you were not talking about a balance calendar which is really just using the same amount it is more time which has all the contract implications and all yes. those kind of things so we did clarify yes. that's what we're talking about just make sure so is there is there interest in I think, exploring this? Yeah, I think there should be it should be an option. It's not for every school. I would think more for the failing schools. I think it's more for the economic social economic uh, failing schools mm -hmm. that are that are in that low group. And so if you do one elementary, one middle school, and one high school, uh, and then they feed into each other the year round school, it'd be just three schools that you're thinking about. So the parents can transfer their students from one school to go to this uh, year-round school. So just like the IP program, the IP program is going to start with Auckland in the elementary level, right? And then we're going to have one in middle school, and we already have one in high school. So there is uh, that option for parents to transfer their child to the IP program. Why don't we give that option to have parents to choose to have that option of a year-round education for their child? So we just make it to three schools that feed into each other. I think we're jumping into the solution right now. She, <laughs> so, okay, she's so just my, trying to gauge if there is interest my, in having. My, my so. thought is that I, I, I want to give staff time to focus on the things that they're focusing mm -hmm. on, and something like that could be an outcome of the campus improvement planning efforts that Dash is leading. You know, it, it could be a remedy in some way. But for now, I feel like we have that in our summer learning program. It exists today for that very reason. So in, 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 so in my idea, we have that, um, and it's all over the city. So um, from a priority point of view, I'd, I'd like to just personally let them focus on the work and see what comes out of the campus improvement plans to determine if it's a logical next thing to do. I understand the desire to reduce the loss of learning. That just might do sense. I, uh, by the way, and it's different than what we're doing in, in the summer. And as I said, I think the first step is to look at what that specific district was doing. And they, as I said, they started with only two elementary schools, and they're seeing great, uh, great results. And, and they started with two failing uh, schools. I, I now remember the number. Those were two schools that were in the bottom, uh, I think they were the bottom 20%, and both schools now are in the top 20%. Okay. I agree. Once again, we have a lot on our plate. And in just using Huffman as an example, that wouldn't be a good solution unless you want to drive all of what we call the neighborhood kids out. Because children who are not behind, who have other enrichment, they won't choose to go year-round. And so I think we're going to have to look hard to find a school that would embrace that construct here in Plano. We don't have any schools that are 100% low socioeconomic. That's you know, the, the category we're trying to help. So I, I agree with Missy that if we need to update our summer programs, strengthen them, have them more targeted, I think that's all in line with what we want to do. But I, I just struggle to, to think of a school in Plano where that would work. Well, and I also think that as we go forward, you've already talked about the summer program, but we're, we're going to be looking at a strategic plan update. And so perhaps we can target that discussion in that regard. I don't want to send staff on all these different studies when we've already got all of this going on. I just feel like we'll lose our focus on the things that are trying to be accomplished. Okay, we've got three who are not in favor. We've got two who are in favor. We haven't heard from Greg. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm probably so not this will either I, I, Yeah, I'm not going to help because I I, <laughs> I, I, I do think that it's, you know, to my earlier point, I do think it's worth looking at some of these sort of out-of-the-box solutions. Um, you know, the, the, in, the, in the readings that I've been doing to, to boost, boost my learning, I, I mean, I, I just don't know that, well, I don't know. 
bottom line, it's getting late. I do think it's worth looking at. Um, now, it, admittedly, this is a heck of a lot of work. Um, so, just my, uh, I think it's worth. It. Can I suggest something? How about if we put it on the list and and with no due date, so that we don't forget it, so that when the time is right, we get back to it. Maybe okay. it's as Nancy said uh, during the strategic planning process. I just don't want us to forget it. Okay, is that agreeable? Okay, so let's write it down, capture the thought, but we don't have an expected due date at this point. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, very good. And with that, this meeting is adjourned.